Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the introduction. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, and I have to do it really fast. Uh, so let's see. Work. So uh, why would we want to do uh, uh, causal inference? Well, we want to do causal inference to like examine effects of treatments and uh, to check if uh, an exposure is harmful or like to check the effects of policy. It, it's kind of like very, uh, um, I guess it's a it's a critical central part of the of uh, of being of doing any science. That's why probably most of you are here, um, but it's not the only one. So, so so I think it's actually a good idea to like actually think about what what does it mean to do causal inference. So to do that, we have to like go a bit back to like think about the philosophical issues. Uh, some people who are smarter than me thought about that. So so they define. Uh, three things that need to happen in, when you have causal inference is one is that that there will be um, somewhat relationship between the cause and effect, right? Like that's that's one thing that we are interested in. Uh, the cause has to come before the effect. That's the second part. And the third the third part is that they are doing it constantly, so it's kind of like repeating each other. Okay, so we can repeat the same stuff over and over. That's the, that's the general idea. Now, does everything needs to be causal? Well, no, okay, like not all statistics has to be causal. I know everyone that comes in like want to make it causal, but not everything has to be causal. You can think about different uh, things that doesn't have to be causal. We want to like check associations uh, for different things. Uh, we want to see if, um, for example, if, if there are, I have another one I think here. Yeah, if like a certain gene is, is, is has a high risk for a disease or we want to see if immigrants can receive worse healthcare. All those things do not have to be causal. They are just, they're just an association, and that's totally fine to describe whatever we are trying to do. If we want to do causal, then, then the next step is to like think, okay, what does it mean to, to do causal uh, um, inference? And then Mills was talking about that, and there's supposed to be some relationship between the cause and the effect, so the cause has to change uh, the outcome in, in some way. Uh, again, the cause has to come before the effect, and um, there is no plausible alternative for the, for, the, for the effect that we see without the cause. Okay? So that's like actually very important. And what he says is you can't do that without actually doing any sort of design. So you need to have some, some research design that you create to actually see that. And what that means, that means that, that if you're talking about causality, then we have to talk about some action. We have to talk about something that we'll, we will manipulate. Or um, I might be a hard line in this, in this aspect, but my take is that you can't ask for causal question unless you can manipulate, or at least hypothetically manipulate. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's, the, one, um, that's the one point that, that I think is important. Um, so, so what happened is that if you don't think about it this way, then there are a bunch of things that um, people are trying to define a causal question, which is very hard to like ask what is the causal question. So for example, um, are people with HIV, who are HIV positive uh, earn less? Well, it's very hard to like, even think about hypothetical intervention that I can remove from someone uh, being HIV positive or I can make someone have, be HIV positive. This is like a very, very hard uh, question. Same thing I can ask about um, if, if race is influencing someone, uh, the care that they are receiving, because I can't remove someone's race or give them their race back. It's it's very very hard thing to do. Uh, so so those things are not um, are not a very well defined causal question. So you want to think when you think about causal question, you want to think about what is the manipulation or at least hypothetical manipulation that I can try and do. Okay, so. So the key question about causal inference is what would have happened under different treatments? That's, that's pretty much the, the main point. And the way that we write that or the way that we formulate that is with that, uh, is that with potential outcome framework. So if we define Y to be our outcome, then the way that then what we have is that uh, Y of treatment one is going to be the outcome under treatment one. So like it will be what my, what if I, if I think about having receiving aspirin or not receiving aspirin, uh, then Y will be, Y under treatment one will be what my outcome would be if I received aspirin, and then Y under treatment two will be what if I didn't receive aspirin. Now, if I have more treatment, so for example, there are different kinds of bariatric surgery, then I can have for each type of bariatric surgery what will be my outcome, and so on and so forth. 
So here is another example just to make it clear. So for example, what I can compare what happened if I eat organic food versus non-organic food. And then like I want to, the effect is going to be on cancer. So like if I eat organic food, would I have cancer or yes or no? And if I don't uh, eat organic food, if I have cancer, yes or no? And then I have uh, four possibilities, right? Like I have why organic is I don't have cancer and then why not organic I have cancer and then all those other, uh, other possibilities. So um, both of them I receive cancer under both of them, I don't receive cancer under both of them and then on organic I receive cancer while on non organic I don't receive cancer, I don't have cancer. So those are like the four possible uh, combinations. And then what the causal effect is a comparison of those, uh, of those two uh, of those two values, okay? So there's a comparison under the treatment and a comparison under the control. And the way that we usually do it, or that we describe it, is called an estimate. How are we gonna describe it is some sort of like an estimate. So here, if, if I continue my example, so for example, if I have, I have two possibilities, for example, uh, why organic is no cancer and why not organic I, I have cancer, so there is a causal effect for that specific person that if he, if he eats organic food, then he will not have cancer, while if he's not eating organic food, uh, then he will, um, uh, would have gotten uh, cancer. And the same thing I can do, uh, so now possibility two is like, under both of them, he would have received cancer. So it doesn't matter what he eats. He can eat organic or not organic, and he will have cancer either way. So live your life, I guess. Um, so, so what we think about it is, uh, what, what we just talked about is, is the specific unit. So unit is, is, what, the, um, is, is, is what we are actually um, uh, implementing the treatment on. And it can be anything that we want. It could be a person, it could be a place, it could be a person in time, at a particular point in time, it could be a school, it could be a hospital, it could be anything that we want, but we just have to like define what it is. And, and it's important to like, understand that the same person at a different point in time is a different unit because the, the effect is on the same, on the same unit, but like, if, if we look at it at a different point in time, you have passed through some other things that like, have changed you in some way, so like, a person at a different point in time is a different unit. Uh, so with quantitative outcomes, what happens is that the causal effect uh, for the same treatment uh, for the same unit might not be the same while for the exactly the same while in uh, um, while if you have uh, a binary outcome or like a discrete outcome you might have the exactly the same one okay so everything that I've defined here and you can see that the causal effect does not depend on the treatment that I observed okay I, I didn't even talk about which treatment you received the causal effect is about a comparison of your outcome under a treatment versus a comparison under a control or under many treatment, however you want to think about that. Um, and it's not about like for asking the question who got the treatment and it's not a before and after comparison. Okay, It's about at that point in time what would have happened if you received one versus the other. Okay, So it's a what if comparison. The only problem is that, that at one point in time, I can only give you one treatment. Unless I believe in quantum world, or I can live in the movies. There is, usually I give this lecture with a bunch of like movies and I show all those movies, but uh, unless you are uh, believing in another world, then you can only observe what would happen to you if I give you one treatment. That's the main, um, that's the main problem. Okay. So what we do for the, for the definition of the causal outcome, we just compare the outcome uh, for a single unit. Uh, we can only see one. So for estimation purposes, we actually have a problem, right? Like I, I'm trying to estimate, I have two values that I'm trying to estimate, but I only have one of them is observed. So I can't do anything with the other one. Like I have to like estimate it. To do that, I have to like see multiple units. And some of those units, uh, what we want to, to have those units is to have them somewhat similar to the unit that we are observing, uh, and they could be uh, units at different points in time or different units at the same point in time. You have to like uh, think how you collect your units. So let's see what happens when I add another unit. So I will add just one more unit. So now when I add unit, it really depends what the other unit would receive. So the first part is 
So the organic here, the first organic, is what the, unit, the first unit received. And then the second one is what the second unit received. So I could have organic and organic. So, the first, so under that, that uh, intervention, the first unit received organic and the second unit received organic. And then we can ask if you have cancer or non-cancer. And then we can have, oh, what happened if the first unit received organic and the second one received non-organic? And then we can have cancer. And the same thing going on for, the for unit two, we have the same, the same problem. So what happened is that, that for my simpler problem, so I had a problem which I observed only 50%, right? Like I, I had one unit, I observed one part, uh, one value out of it. Uh, I, I have two values that I wanted to estimate. I only observed one, so my problem was like 50%. Here what I have is two units, okay? So now when I have two units, I can only observe two values. So out of like the eight possible uh, values, I'm only observing two, so now I only observe 25% of the um, of the actual value. So my problem is getting much worse. Now you can think if I had three, it's gonna be three out of like two to the third, two to three, which is, um, which is uh, 16, I will have two, uh, 16 possibilities. So all those things are gonna get harder and harder as I add more uh, units. So the problem gets worse, and therefore what we have to do is start making assumptions, okay? So we can't ask a causal question, we can't make a, a causal inference question without making assumption. The only thing that we have to do is make sure that those assumptions are plausible or not plausible. So the first one that usually people make is something called the SUTVA assumption or the stable unit treatment value assumption. And it has two parts. The first part is saying that there are no interference. That means that uh, unit one does not influence, the a treatment that unit ones receive is not influencing the treatment that other people receive. You can think, here is an example. If I have uh, two people and uh, uh, both of us have headaches and we're sitting in the same room and we're getting, um, and there is aspirin, and one of us would get the aspirin. So for example, if I get the aspirin, my headache goes away, and I'm all fine. But uh, let's say that my, uh, my friend get the aspirin, it does not get the aspirin, then he sits there and he just like drills into my head, oh, my head hurts, my head hurts, and we're in the same room. I don't think it matters if I received aspirin or not, my head will hurt in the end, right? So, so that doesn't, so that actually, what happened is that the, the suit by assumption is violated. So this, the, whatever treatment that the other person received is actually going to influence what my outcome would be. So uh, as I said, the non-interference uh, in more practical senses, for example, if you have a, uh, a vaccination, a bunch of people receiving the vaccination around you is going to reduce your chances of getting certain uh, disease. Uh, there are other places where uh, interference is, is uh, violated. The other part is, uh, that there is only one version of the treatment. Okay? That, that's actually a very important uh, point because, and usually glossed over, because we treat all, all those treatments are exactly the same. But for example, when I talk to my uh, diabetes collaborators, they actually give, when, you, when they're comparing, they're comparing to a standard of care. A standard of care in diabetes is a slew of things. It could be a bunch of drugs that you are comparing to, and each one is like going to be different. So between trials, you might even get like different type of like comparisons. So that's so that's one thing that that people usually don't uh, consider. Now, this is an assumption that can't be verified from the data. Like there is no way that I can verify this assumption. This assumption is being made, and you could like we can argue about it if it's if it's true or not true, but it can't be verified out from the data. So there are, there are different ways to like handle this, this assumption uh, has been done uh, uh, in design phase, uh, the way that they do it uh, in educational pro uh, programs where they take schools which are really far apart. We can also think about like hospitals which are far apart. Um, and sometimes by assumption was done, uh, I don't know how many of you know, but there is cloud seeding example when they try to like get rains in the desert to come down. So. Uh, there they have days that, that are very, that are close to each other, but they assume that they doesn't matter. If you like sit in one day, it doesn't affect the next day. There are other ways uh, that people have devised that you could do it in an analysis phase. Again, we're not gonna get into that, but there are a bunch of like papers about that. Okay, so when I have multiple units, and I, an important part that I need to know is, uh, is uh, some covariates, and covariates are, are characteristics that are not affected by the actual treatment. 
that's uh, that's their main part, and they may and they may be related to the assignment to treatment. Uh, my my decision if I have one treatment or the other, and I will call them X. This is just to like make everything clear. So if I want to define what the science is, so this is pretty much a table of the science. And what does it say? It says that on the rows there are patients, there are units, and for each unit I will see the observed covariate, and then there is like is potential outcomes. Okay? And this is set. So what, what your potential outcome would be is set. It's not probabilistic. There is no probability attached to it. It's the set number. So if I eat organic food, would I get cancer or not? Yes. And if I don't eat organic food, if I get cancer or not, that's it. Like I don't have a probability of like getting cancer if I eat or don't eat. It's like a set number. The only problem is that that's what we usually see. Okay? What we usually see is different type of uh, values. Okay, the other parts are not always observed. That's, that's, uh, that's what happens, and we can think about it in, for different treatments. So the observed data is, depending on the treatment that you got, is filled with actually, so those, for the, those that received the first treatment, I only observed their value under the first treatment, and for those under the second, only the second, and for those under the third, only the third. That's all that I see. The rest of them are a bunch of like missing values. Okay, so I'm just going to define some notations that I think we're going to use throughout the presentation so you will have that in your mind and we will have Y will be the outcome, uh, W will be the treatment, I will be units usually, uh, WI equal T will be the uh, indicate, it will be equal to one if, if the treatment that you receive is T and then we have uh, YI observed are the values that you observe for that, uh, for that uh, person, and then why I miss will be the values that you've not observed. So the treatments that you did not receive or the person did not receive. Okay, so because we have multiple units, we need to like summarize them. Okay, so we want to summarize our causal effect. There are different ways to do it. The first one is through uh, unit level. So for every person, that's like what I think about in precision medicine is like for every person we can see uh, their actual value, yi1 minus yi0. Uh, you could, if you have a bunch of like values for that person over time, then you could do the mean of that person minus the mean of under the other treatment. And then there is finite population estimate, which is usually what we get from a, from a randomized trial. We can look only at that randomized trial, see what the, uh, what the uh, differences are. And the superpopulation is about generalizing it to the population, so I'm sure that, that Disa is going to talk about that and, and tell you how he uh, proposed to like move from one to another, but, but those are like the different type of estimates. Those are different estimates. So here the, so here the expectation, this, val, this E is an expectation or average over a certain population, and here it's only within that trial. The summation is over the trial. Now you could do the same thing with, with more than two treatments, it actually gets more complex because how we summarize it when we have a bunch of treatments is, is getting more complex. Is it the best one out of them? Is it uh, three-way comparisons? There, there, it just gets slightly more complex that people don't always think about when they um, do a study, but I'm just going to skip that for now because it's not as, as critical. So one, one way, one statistic that most of you use or like most of us use is the difference in averages. So the difference in averages is the sum is the average difference across all units, okay? So you can see here I, I means the first, for the first unit, that the effect under the, the first treatment minus the effect under the second treatment, it's for that unit, okay? And then I sum it over all units. So it's the difference for each unit, if I could observe it, the difference for each unit, and then I take the average of the difference. What people usually do, is uh, replace it by what they observed. So they look at the average among, um, among those that were receiving treatment one minus the average minus those that have received treatment two, and they say that this is equal to the same thing, and it actually is not. Those two quantities are not the same, um, and it actually leads to a bias. So let's, let's show you an example. Uh, well, the reason is, is the assignment mechanism, and the assignment mechanism is the reason that you received certain treatments. So, I like to show you uh, a certain example. So let's look at a, an example. So I have here four patients, okay, and I have their 
actual uh, value, and let's say that higher values are better. Okay, so I have their value under the treatment and their value under the control. And what happened here is this is a perfect doctor in choosing the treatment. What does it mean? You always choose the one that will give you the higher value. Okay, you always, well, it's not choosing. First, I will start, oh, I, I skipped myself to the next slide. What I would say here is that, that the true values are here. So like if I, for patient one, it's better to receive uh, treatment one. For patient two, it's better to receive the not receive, not have surgery. Uh, for, for three is to receive it. And then for uh, four is to not, okay? So the overall average is two. So the overall causal effect is two if I average the entire population because I take the average of that differences. Now let's look what the perfect doctor has done. The perfect doctor has chosen the right treatment for me. What does it mean? It means that for uh, patient one, he said, oh, treatment one, I, sh I would choose this one. For patient two, I will choose the uh, six. I will give him the drug because it's not going to work slightly better. Uh, for treatment three, it's going to be five. And then eight uh, for that, for this patient. And then my observed value is seven, six, five, eight, because this is based on the observed value. Now, if you look at seven plus five divided by two minus six plus eight divided by two, which is the difference in those observed averages, we get minus one. So that means that the treatment is negatively impacting you, while we know that from the true value, it's supposed to be positive. Okay, so the causal effect here will be two, the average causal effect is two, while the, uh, if we just use the observed value, we're gonna get minus one. So that does tell us that the, that, the, uh, that the drug is better than the surgery while it's actually not correct. And the problem was that the, um, in order to, to define this causal inference and in order to overcome that, we need to understand the assignment mechanism. The assignment mechanism, the reason that you received a certain treatment. So this is the definition of, uh, uh, of assignment mechanism. It's the probability of observing, uh, of receiving treatment given your covariates and your, all your potential outcomes. Now, there is a slightly different here. You can see this is the vector of all possible uh, treatments for everyone. And then I could actually reduce it to look only at one person. This is for a specific person. Okay, and there are three, few, few characteristics that we want to have from uh, an assignment mechanism. We hope that it's individualistic, probabilistic, ignorable. You don't have to know all those things. I'm going to go about them uh, right now, so I will tell you what they are. So uh, the individualistic says that, that my uh, receiving a treatment is only depending on my values. It does not depend on other people, what other people have received. Um, this is usually true in many cases in simple randomized experiment, but if you are talking about adaptive trials, a lot of the new adaptive trials, that's not true anymore. Okay? Because my reason to receive those, uh, those outcomes are dependent on what the outcomes were of other people in that trial. So, so that's, not, that's where it's not going to work. So you have to like, think about that. In probabilistic means that everyone has a chance to receive the treatment or like that you have a positive chance to receive at least one, a positive chance to receive any of the treatments that are there. Um, some of those are not probabilistic. So for example, the perfect doctor that I've just seen, he's so smart, he, can, he has like this uh, ball for, for him that he can like read the future and therefore it's not probabilistic. There is no probability attached to it. Or if you look at a federal policy, it's not probabilistic because everyone is gonna get it. Okay, there is no probability attached to it. And sometimes we have to like eliminate units to make it probabilistic because some units have no chance of getting it. If they're very sick, for example, people who are extremely sick will not get chemotherapy. So I can't like see what the effects on those people are. Now ignorable, uh, ignorable means that it only depends on your observed value. So the observed value is X and Y obs. Um, this is actually useful in certain cases, again, Adaptive trial is only depending on the observed value. It doesn't depend on, on future values, on unobserved values. And there is another place called synthetic control, which we can go to another lecture on, but I'm not going to go into, um, where, you, where you observe people from the past and you use that to like, predict the future. Or relationship from the past to predict the future. Uh, and the last one, 
just removes the y. So if you look here, it says the ignorable says uh, it, it, really, it, it is conditioned on the observed value. So it's conditioned on the outcome, on the observed outcome. And the last value is unconfounded, which is only uh, does not depend anymore on the observed value. So um, sometimes we can make, so for example, the perfect doctor that I just described is not, um, is not unconfounded, but I can make it unconfounded if I can look at the same things that the doctor have looked at when he made these decisions. So if I look at the same charts or the same person that made this decision, then I could make it uh, unconfounded. Now, what's important, why do I want unconfounded? Well, if I have unconfounded, then I can compare units uh, with the same value of x. So similar units, or whatever we call similar units, would they have the same covariate value, then I can compare them and get their causal effects. That's the general idea. OK, so a few things that happen. So observational studies are rarely unconfounded. There are always reasons why. Uh, some certain people receive a drug or receive a treatment and the other ones did not. Uh, what we try to do is to approximate it, get it as close as we can to that, to that place, and we do that by collecting as many covariates as possible. Because if you have a lot of covariates, then you could say, oh, I can protect you from, or not I can protect you, the assumption is more plausible. The con unconfounded assumption is more plausible. Um, and that's why it's important generally to collect a lot of uh, covariates. Okay, the last thing that is, that is different is, is the no, is about the assignment mechanism is known and controlled. So known and controlled means that I know what the reasoning is. And for example, in a randomized experiment, I randomize you to certain values and I can control it. So I, so I, so I know what the probability is and I can control it. And in observational study, I do not know. So that's, if I have to summarize it, then uh, observational studies uh, we don't know if they're individualistic, probabilistic, unconfounded, all those things, and they're certainly not known in control. Uh, so, that's, so that's the general idea. So, so that's the difference between those two. If I have a ran that's why randomized experiments are generally m preferable. But uh, we are stuck with observational studies many times. And why is that? Uh, it's because of like cost or ethical considerations or it's easy to get the data sets. That's usually the reason that I get. Um, and other, you know, and, and money-wise and, and other, and other uh, ideas. Also for generalizability and other things, it's uh, observational studies are usually useful. Uh, okay, so a couple of things. So the, the one thing that I think is important is, is to try and have uh, objectivity when you, when you design your trial, or when you design any study. So at least in the randomized experiment, we design, we have a full design phase that, that um, says exactly how, um, that says exactly how we're going to do the analysis, that says exactly how we're going to randomize, that says exactly how we're going to follow people. There is a full protocol to do that. And there is no reason, there is no reason to not do that in an observational study. All those same things can apply to observational studies, and at least it makes you more objective. And one thing, one way to, to make it also objective is to like to have a design that does not include outcomes. Okay, I don't have to like look at the outcome when I when I analyze observational studies. I can keep the outcome aside, and I will show you later uh, some ideas about that. I can keep them aside and still do the design the same way. So what I would say is, I can balance the unit. I can do all those things, and I can do it without actually looking at any outcome. So. Uh, let's think about that. So, so what do I define by design? Design is everything that, that is happening before I actually see the outcome data and all those things that I could do is I can contemplate, I collect the data, I can create a covariate balance, I can specify an analysis plan, can say exactly what I'm going to do, and then uh, all the hard work is done at the analysis phase. So everything I can do is at the analysis phase. I don't have to like, um, it's actually a lot of work to do, but I don't need the outcome to do that. And that Pre uh, prevents me from like doing all those kind of like feeding and overfeeding and like trying to like uh, trying to get to the point where I'm where I'm interested in or like get the results that I want to. And then the analysis phase is going to be easy because we already defined what the protocol is, so we're just going to follow the pre-specified protocol for the analysis. That's the general idea. So. Um, 
what happened in many uh, observational studies is that people examine different models and analyses which introduce like subjectivity and bias to the, uh, to the data. And then, as I said, the one solution is to make it, um, to define it in advance. I would say one, one, one place where you could do it, you could look only at, uh, for example, at the control group, try to do your analysis only at the control group and then implement the same thing on the, on the full population. So at least uh, if you're really worried about your, your exact analysis. Okay, so I had to do it really fast. So, so that was fast and I think I, I'm done here. So like I left enough time for questions, right? Eight minutes or so? 11 minutes, I left 11 minutes for questions. Done. Yes. How about missing data, whether it's uh, missing data and the covariance that can be outcome be taken into consideration during mitigation? You're only ruining my next presentation, like in a, an hour and a half or, or whatever it is. Uh, I will show it to you then. How about that? <laughs> Pulling my punchline. Um, other question? Yes? Okay, so I will, I will try to break that question into two and I have to like repeat that because they told me that, um, that they have to have it for their call, right? Like, okay, uh, for the online people. Uh, so the question is about, the first part is about unmeasured confounding. Uh, and yes, so the, the question about unmeasured confounding is the real question. Uh, there, there, are two, there are two ways to deal with that. Uh, one, I think, is a design one and, and actually think about collect all the data that you think might have influenced it. And if you can't do that, maybe you can collect all the proxies, but as you collect more data, then you're reducing your chances of uh, having um, unconfounded assignment mechanism. That's the, that's the first advice that I could give you. Uh, the second one is we can do sensitivity analysis uh, to see if we still believe that there is unconfounded in some way, uh, which I'm gonna talk about in, in, uh, in one of my, in the later talk, that's the other part. Now the second question was about uh, using instrumental variables. Again, instrumental variable is a good is a good idea, uh, but it also has an assumption. Um, there are the paper by the, the seminal paper by uh, Engrist, uh, uh, Imbens, and Rubin that like describe the the assumptions that you that you need to have there. And those assumptions are also untestable and hard to like uh, and they're not always valid. It's very very hard like and. So, so you live, you live with your poison, right? Like that's what happens. Like it, you can, the best way to do it is to design a randomized experiment. That's that's the best way to like to like do it. If this is the question, if we, if we can't, then we can like start talking about um, uh, instrumental variables, and and that's fine. That's a that's a legit one. But we have to, but you have to like do the sensitivity analysis to those assumptions, and those are like different assumptions. And finding the instrument is not always a, a straightforward. So that's. So yes, we can. It, it lives in within that same framework, or we could live it within the same framework. We just have to like uh, worry about those assumptions. Okay. Other question. Yes. Well, so so actually, there are there are a few questions there. Uh, I will repeat that. Uh, the question was about um, repeated measures and how they are, um, how they affect the estimation in causal inference, right? Like it, that's, that's the question. So, so that's actually a good question. I think that it depends on two things. First of all, we have to define what's the, what's the estimate. And what do I mean by estimate? Are we averaging for every patient their, uh, all their repeated measure and then divide it? That's one way. <laughs> And then um, we can do it the same, or, or we're looking at each time point about difference. There are, there are diff we have to define what the estimate is first. That's, that's the first point that I would make. 
Now there are different ways to like do that, and now you could like use different model. You could you can use some of those things you could do through imputation, and some of those things you will have to like do in a, in a different way. Like what one of the problem is that sometimes when you look over time, there is uh, people who drop over time, and now you have to like start thinking, okay, how do I deal with that? So I can make that that same causal inference as co as complicated as as we want, and and I obviously some of my research deals with those things, but it really, really depends. I think it, oh, it starts from like, first of all, defining the estimate, then we can like start asking, okay, what are, what are the type of uh, methods that we can use to solve that? I don't know, do we have more? Five more minutes. Five more minutes for questions. Yes. Yes, so the question was about like the definition of causal inference, of like well-defined causal inference. So what, what does it mean to have, what, and, and in the central, in the potential outcome? Well, this is, this is a great question. So, so let's think about a gene, okay? Like people like to talk about that in biology. So there is a gene that causes, or that's what they call it, they causes a certain disease. What does it mean a gene causes a, a certain disease? A gene causes a certain disease means that everything else has to be exactly equal. I can't find one person that I would like hold his, all the genes exactly the same and just like turn it on and off one gene. Very, very hard to do in human. Maybe in mice or maybe in bacteria, maybe it's possible. But in, in human, it's very, very hard to do. So saying, oh, it's all depending on that gene. The causal question is all on that gene. It's kind of like a hard question to ask. It's not a well necessarily well-defined <laughs> causal inference because it depends what treatment am I doing. I can use a chemotherapy, right? And I kill everything around it, and then I then I have a, a very well-defined causal question. I could we call it knockdown, right? Like I can knock down a specific gene, but usually it has like other implication. It's not the same thing. So the idea of the causal inference again is is for like something that is manipulable and defining and, and some certain things are not manipulable. I can't manipulate someone's race. It's very, very hard. There are experiments that were done on, they took the names of the, the last names of people which are um, more correlated with certain race and they sent that as a CV for someone else, but they, uh, for like seeing if they get, if they have higher chances of getting a job. But then the question is on your last name, right? Like the, the question is not necessarily on your race, it's on, it's, it's on your last name. You could say that maybe r that race is correlated with that, that's why how people decided that, but that's a different question. Like so, so you have to be very careful when, when you define that, and that's like how those potential outcomes are because they are talking about certain manipulation. Like, yes, we can write it, the, the mathematics doesn't say, oh, you have to write it this way or that way. The mathematics is the same for everything, but it's not necessarily coherent to like, combat, to like look at it from that frame. Does this answer the question? Okay. Other question? Yes. So then in that sense, wouldn't most experiments be a causal question about the assignment of treatment as opposed to like giving a drug? Well, most, ex yes. Uh, well, if, if they are complete compliance, then it's exactly the same, right? Like because if they are complete uh, compliance, then it's about the drug itself. What happened is that Many times, many experiments do not have complete compliance. Now there are many things that people have done to like try and estimate those values, which is good or bad, like we can like argue about that. But when we, that's the difference between IDT, for example, intention to treat, which is about the randomization versus <coughs> S treated that actually got the drug. And that's like the, that's actually the, the difference. And it goes back and it's also core, if you can combine it to, uh, to the instrumental variable question that was asked before, which is kind of like related to but yes, that, that's exactly true. If they are exactly the same, if everyone complied and everyone took their drug, then, then the drug is actually doing that best. But if it's not, then now there is a question what the actual Great. Other questions? I'm off the hook. All right. <laughs> So we're going to do this.
same thing um, here. Uh, we'll, we'll take a short break after this session. So uh, we'll save the questions for then. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me in the back? And thank Chris for organizing this symposium. And um, thanks for asking me to give a, a talk on one of my favorite topics. Um, and today, I will give a, a, a very uh, brief introduction to causal mediation analysis. Um, so um, in most of our biomedical research, uh, social science, and behavioral science, we are very often interested in, in uh, causality. Um, so instead of just the, simply the, the association. So causality means uh, the, the fact from a, a, a treatment or exposure which happened before the outcome. And when we establish a causality, um, which is usually um, like a black box thing, and uh, it's either significant or non-significant, you want to further investigate what's going on along the causal pathway from the exposure or treatment to the outcome. And mediation analysis provides a tool to uncover this, this kind of black box uh, causality. And in mediation, a mediator means uh, a factor that caused by a exposure or treatment and produce some effect on the outcome. And the medi mediator happened after the treatment or exposure and before the outcome. This is some time for order here. So the question now is, what's the mediation? So in Baron, uh, Baron Kenny, in their one of the most famous paper in uh, mediation liter, uh, literature, they define mediation as um, a mechanism through which the focal independent variable, which is treatment or exposure, that's, that is able to influence, influence the uh, dependence uh, variable interest, which is the outcome so-called outcome. So the, 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 the total effect, the to total causal effect, can be decomposed into an indirect effect, which transmitted through a hypothesized uh, mediator or mediators. And a direct effect, which is, is from A, which is exposed to Y, or in general, you can consider it as the, as the contribution of other unspecified causal pathways. So here's a little bit formal definition. Um, so there's two type of causal uh, uh, mediation effects. One is the direct effect, which you can think about as the treatment effect on the outcome when you fix the mediator at some fixed levels. Okay, not necessarily all, all, all on, on the same level, but some fixed level. And an indirect effect, which is, um, can be conceived as the effect of the outcome when you change the exposure and which can operate through the, uh, the mediator uh, factors. So um, now let's look at how to estimate this uh, direct and indirect effects. Uh, let me first go through a conventional method, which is Baron Kenny's method, which um, has been used for many, many years. Um, consider we, uh, we have this simple uh, model here. We have A, which is exposure, and now let's make it simple. Say A is randomized, okay? And we have M, which is a medi uh, is a one, uh, one factor, is a mediator, and Y, which is the outcome. We can first do an uh, outcome model by regressing the outcome Y on just A. Here, A is randomized. Um, then we can estimate the coefficient of A, C prime, which gave us the total effect. Now, this is the to total causal effect. Next, we can fit a mediator model by regressing the mediator M on A, which is the treatment or exposure. Then we can guess um, the effect, the causal effect from A to M, which is, since A is randomized, so A is the causal effect from A to, uh, to from exposure to M. I'm talking about this later A. Um, and then we can fit another outcome model, Y, by regressing Y on both A and M. Then we can estimate two coefficients, C, C and, sorry, uh, C and B. B gave us the so-called mediator, uh, the, the effect from mediator on Y. Then we can obtain uh, the indirect effect by timing, by the product A and A, A of B 
or by subtract C from C prime. Okay. So this is a traditional approach called Baron Candy approach. And the, the, the only challenge here is the significant test. I will not go through the detail here, but this, this method is very simple to use. And actually, it's, uh, this method is being used by many, many people. Um, so here is uh, just, just Google Scholar uh, about the citation of their paper. So up to now, this paper has been cited by more than 76,000 uh, pa other papers. And however, this Baron Kenny has several limitations. Um, actually, a, a list of limita limitations. One of the limitations is it assumes there's no major uh, mediator outcome confounders. That means there's no, medi uh, there's no confounding, uh, confounding factors from M to Y. All right? This is a very strong assumption. The second assumption is mediator can be externally changed to any level can be mani uh, uh, like, uh, like Roy said, manipulation here can be changed to any things, you, any level you want, which is a very strong assumption. All right, so now let's consider other definition of mediation effect. So the, we had talked about like briefly the control indirect effects, which is basically assume you can impose some uh, manipulation on this, this mechanism and can change the mediator at any level. Then you have, like, each Y hat, each outcome has four potential outcomes. I'll, I'll go through this later. So Y, little a, little m, and then you can just fix the, the, the treatment expert at some level a and just change the mediator. Then you have this controlled indirect effect. And there's another type of definition called natural mechanism. The only thing is you can fix the the treatment at a certain level, and suppose you take the, the, the induced change of the mediator and make the comparison that gave it the, the, the indirect, I'll go through this later. Um, and this is called the natural indirect effect. All right, so now back to this potential outcome. I will use a lot of uh, knowledge Roy has, has, uh, has presented. Um, so let's consider a simple case. Say we have a binary treatment or binary exposure a, which is, is uh, uh, the exposure here, we take two values, zero, one, say one is treated, zero is control. Then each individual has two potential mediator outcome, M0 or M1, okay? So some people, their mediator factors can be changed by the treatments. Then M0, M1, they can be two different values. But for some people, their mediator cannot be changed by treatment. So this is the challenge for mediation analysis. Not everyone, not the, uh, everyone can be changed for their media, me, mediation factors. So now the, the, the poten potential outcome for each people can be written in these four different ways. They can take these four different uh, values. So A, uh, Y, one M1 just means the potential outcome is this person receive treatments. And, at, and when their mediator value is at the, value, at the level when they receive the treatment. And Y0 M1 is the potential outcome if this person uh, didn't receive the treatment, but their, medi their mediator uh, uh, factor, mediation factor somehow can be manipulated to the M1, uh, M1, which is the level they will, they will be if they, re if they receive the treatment. And so on, we have four, uh, two other potential outcome. And for the, then the individual, at the individual level, as for each person, we can make a contrast between these two potential outcomes. Okay, um, so say we fix the treatments as, so hypothetically, if we give everyone the treatments, however, for some, for someone, uh, I would say this not. This is like to compare two two potential outcomes. One is, one is so everyone receive the treatments, and this potential outcome is everyone receive treatment, and everyone's mediators is taking the value if they receive treatments, and this 
is the potential potent outcome if everyone received the treatments and their mediator is at the level if they do not receive the treatment. So it's a little awkward, but this is the definition of natural, uh, the causal mediation effect. Then the, 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 the natural indirect effect is a contrast of these two, two values, okay? And we say causal, uh, 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 causal natural indirect is the average value of this, this, two, this, this uh, the difference of these two values. And this is the Dirac effect. This is relatively easier to think about. And suppose we have or fix the mediator at the level if everyone re do not receive the treatment ju and just changed the, the exposure from control to treatment. And this is the contrast. This is the natural Dirac effect. So this is this two defect is basically the, the central piece of the con uh, causal mediation analysis. As I, as you can see. The challenge here is this value, the, the potential outcome of Y1 M0, okay? So we cannot observe this value. All right, this is the identification problem. Um, so to estimate this value, there's a several approach. And one of the common assumptions uh, we make is called sequential, sequential ignorability. So mathematically, it can be written in this way. Um, put in language, it just means uh, within each, uh, within, within levels of pretreatment con confounders, the treatment is ignorable. The first, the first condition means, it just means conditional on X, you can think of exposure or treatment is randomized. The second assumption is within level of pretreatment confounders, within the given the baseline confounders, X, the mediator is ignorable given the observed treatments. So given the treatments and also the baseline uh, covariates, you can think about medi mediator is randomized. And there are several approach, there are several approaches that can be used to do the uh, mediation analysis. Like Roy mentions, uh, instru instrument, uh, instrumental variable method is one approach. It basically assumes that um, there's no direct effects, all right? There's only indirect effects. And with some, some uh, 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 set of assumptions, you can estimate uh, this indirect effects. It co either cause uh, complier tr uh, treatment effects or um, uh, it's, it's just call it the, 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 the instrumental variable, the, the IV uh, treatment effects. And they assume there's no um, exposure mediator interaction. Sorry, this is a typo here. It should be A. Um, so no uh, A by M interaction. And uh, Ruben in 2000, in, in their 2000 papers, described a marginal structure model, which can be used to estimate uh, a control direct effect. Uh, and for natural direct and indirect effect, we can use uh, 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 Wheels paper in 2009. Again, uh, these papers assume there's no A, there's no treatment and mediator interactions. And um, there's also uh, uh, a modified regression approach that can be used to, to estimate uh, the natural direct and the indirect effect. And uh, there's another approach called resampling approach. It basically, you can, based on your observed data, fit a model which describe the uh, the, uh, the mediator value given the treatments, and also the outcome given the mediator value and the treatments. And based on this model, you can simulate the potential outcome, the potential outcome for mediator, the potential outcome for the, uh, uh, for the outcome. And then based on this simulated uh, value, you can calculate the, the average difference uh, of this difference potential outcome to get the direct and indirect effects. Um, and there's another approach called weighted methods or inverse probabil probability weighting. Um, you can, uh, if, we, if A is randomized, we can estimate this value, the Y1 and 1, just based on the people who receive the treatment. Okay, if A is, run is randomized. Um, for Y0, M0, this is observed for those who 
who didn't receive the treatment. So we can just calculate the average of, of those. And for this, Y1M0, we can use some way to estimate, given certain assumption. And there's a, a very rich uh, paper on this. So here I, I just do a simple simulation study to il illustrate the idea and I compare <coughs> balance candidates methods and also the med uh, causal mediation methods. Um, suppose we have um, A here is, the, is the, the treatment or exposure, M is the mediator, Y again is the outcome, and we have L, which is the confounder, which is the measure, and we have some unmeasured confounder U here. All right. and, um, for this model, I assume the direct effect from A to Y is two. Uh, the indirect effect is uh, 0.4 times 7.5, which is three. Um, and because uh, this is some unmeasured confounding U here, so if you do a regression analysis, somehow you can get, you get biased estimates. And I, I, I control the, direct, the, the effect, the association or the effect from, uh, from U to L I let it vary from zero to seven, which basically control the confounding effect. If there's zero effect from U to L, it just means there's no confounding effect, okay? Uh, from M to Y, there's no confounding effect. Uh, if, if it's, it's 0.7, it means this is strong confounding effect from Y, from M to Y. All right, and here's the simulation result. Um, so I use the inverse probability weighting to estimate the, the natural direct and indirect effect, um, which is shown by the blue uh, triangles and, and blue circles, all right? And the y-axis uh, -ax -ax is the degree of confounding. Remember, that's I control the, the, the strength association between L and U. By, by, uh, by doing this, I control the confounding effects. So when there's no confounding effect, both the Barron and Candy methods and the IPW method gave you the crack estimates of direct effect and the indirect effect. And if it, when you increase the confounding effects, all right, um, the IPW methods can still give you crack estimates of direct and indirect effect. But Barron and Candy, um, Barron and Candy methods, it can yield the crack estimates of the indirect effects. But, but the method failed to estimate the direct effects. And as some extreme case, the Baron candy method even uh, gave the opposite estimate of the direct effects. So this is the problem with Baron candy methods. And as you can see that, if you know the, the literature of the causal, uh, uh, the causal inference, L here is, is a collider, this so-called collider. So when you have a collider, collider means when you have two factor well, two or more factors that have causal effect on them, okay? So if you have two factors uh, ha, uh, that have causal effect on them, when you condition on these factors, you in induce some association in the backgrounds. So we, we need to be very careful by conditioning on covariate that's, that's our uh, colliders. Okay, and here's the illustration by applied the, uh, the IPW methods to the science study, uh, which we published last year uh, at HIV and uh, uh, AIDS and behavior, sorry, AIDS and behavior. So the, the science study stands for the study of, uh, understand, uh, uh, the study to understand the natural history of HIV. Um, so this is a prospective longitudinal cohort study. Okay, um, it's conducted from uh, 2004 and 2012. And the study enrolled 700 participants uh, in four study sets uh, in Denver, uh, Minneapolis, St. Louis, and Providence. And we cl uh, collect the clinical outcome uh, the data uh, at six months interval for over six years. So this is a longitudinal stu uh, study. Um, and we consider, we we'll focus only those who received the ART at the study enrollments. Um, so these are two behavioral outcome. One is drinking. We, we think of drinking as exposure. And somehow, like, we just, just assume that this drinking can be manipulated. All right, this may not be a correct assumption, but now let's say this can be changed. And, or changed by 
or um, among certain populations can be changed by some intervention. And there's some behavior uh, of ART adherence. Okay, uh, maybe I should present this, this uh, hypothet hypothetical mechanism here. So we are kind of interesting in the, the, the heavy drinking, which called, we, 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 we use as a treatment or exposure. We want to study the, the heavy drinking effects on Y, which is several clinical outcomes, through ART adherence, okay? So drinking with, our hypothesis is drinking, if you're drinking a lot, having drinking can reduce the ART adherence, adherence so it will um, worsen the clinical outcome among these HIV uh, positive people. All right. Um, and what interest in several clinical outcomes, and this is just why. One is HIV viral load, the number of virus, HIV virus uh, that circulates inside human body. CD4 count, uh, FIB4, which is a liver function, uh, EGFR, uh, hemoglobin, VAX score, which is uh, like a calculated score that can quantify the risk of mortality among these people. And uh, we also have uh, data about pe uh, people's age, gender, depression, employment status, and we're gonna adjust for this, uh, this factor. We treat them as a confounder. Um, yes. So this is, uh, this is, actually this is a longitudinal study. So <clears throat> we measure the heavy drinking over time and uh, we measured ART adherence over time and also the, uh, the, 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 the clinical outcome. So to establish the causal inference, first thing we, 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 we need to make sure is the temporal order. So the heavy drinking, we use the heavy drinking as the previous visit, all right? And the ART adherence, which is reported adherence between the previous, previous visit and current visits, and the outcome is the outcome class as current visit. So we have this temporal order, right? Okay, so we, we adjust for these confounders. So time independent factors, uh, which, which is the baseline factors, which includes the demographic variables, age, gender, uh, race, ethnicity, education level, uh, hepatitis, hepatitis B, uh, and HBV, HCV, and their co-infection and study sets. Assume that uh, uh, these factors can, uh, the, all these baseline factor factors can confound uh, the A to Y, uh, A, A to M, uh, uh, A, A, uh, can confound the causal effect from A to M, and also it can confound the, uh, the causal effect from A to Y. And assume that by conditioning on this, this confounding effect can be removed. And also, <clears throat> we adjust for these time varying factors, which includes marijuana and other drug use, smoking, depression, uh, the empo uh, 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 employment status, et cetera. So this, here's the result. <clears throat> um, so this is the result of alcohol, the heavy drinking on different clinical outcomes. The first one is detectable very low which is the estimate here gave it the R3 issue, all right? So uh, we found significant results, look at the p-value, for both direct and indirect effects, the natural direct effect and natural indirect effect. Um, it means heavy drinking increase the risk of having the, the uh, detectable viral load through, the, and, the, the, and both the direct effects and the indirect are significant. Uh, so that in other words, Drinking can increase the risk of having detectable, uh, detectable viral loads and, the, def and, and the, the direct effects, and, and both direct effects and the indirect effects are significant. Um, and the same for CD4 counts, both direct effects and indirect are significant, and heavy drinking can lower the CD4 counts among this population. Uh, FIB4 is significant, but the, the magnitude is very small. And interestingly, um, the, the, uh, the alcohol use can increase the hemoglobin, and this, and this only direct effect. Uh, I guess this, this, this kind of, uh, uh, I talked to my collaborators, and it, this is, uh, this, uh, I think people who drink alcohol uh, generally have higher hemoglobin, so this is kind of no knowledge. 
um, and also the, uh, the VAC score, which gave you the, um, the, um, the risk of mortality. And, and, and the alcohol can increase the risk of mortality. And alcohol use uh, among this HIV population and the only indirect effect is significant. That means the, if you want to lower the risk, a lower the risk of mortality, probably some intervention is needed among these alcohol use people to increase their ART adherence, which makes sense now. Um, and um, here's just uh, several extension I want to talk about. First extension is, so in the last example, uh, I basically assume that A is randomized. It's not, uh, can be randomized, conditional on baseline uh, uh, covariance. So um, the first tension is that when A is not randomized, um, we can um, assume that the confounding effects of measure covariance uh, L, L2, which is the confounding factor, and this confounding effect can be removed by um, having this analysis conditional on L2. There's two approach, at least two approaches can be used. One is to do a regress analysis using L2 as the independent variables. Uh, another approach is to a stratify analysis by stratifying on L2. The second extension, um, so when there's uh, a miser confounding exists at baseline, then in this case, we need some, we need some kind of sensitivity analysis because you cannot remove uh, all the confounding effects, and you cannot treat A as randomized. Um, in this case, we, we can encode the impact of uh, major confounding U2 by some kind of sensitivity parameter and let it vary over its plausible range and do a sen sensitivity analysis. And you can see the one of Will's paper in 2010 and Emi's paper in 2010. And of course, uh, very often we're dealing with more than one mediators. Um, and this is very complicated. And at, le at least, uh, um, um, like, it, it, because mediator can, can, can interact with each other. That's the problem. Um, and one paper is, is actually uh, still manuscript uh, by John and Hogan in 2011. Um, that paper studied the, the, this, this approach, and that can be applied in this case. Uh, a brief summary. Um, so mediation analysis review uh, more of like how and why a treatment works, or gave you some detailed information how the, the mechanism uh, ca causality operates from the exposure of, from treatment to the outcome. So traditional, traditional methods such as Baron Kenny. Um, they have some problem of, of like assu assuming s strong sequential ignorability, um, which is make them like not very suitable for analysis when you have unmeasured confounders, and um, and there's some limitation there. But still, they are most widely used in current uh, uh, like literature. And I'm not saying that math is wrong, but still there are some limitation. Um, and the, the causal model approach, causal mediation analysis, that provides some, a new approach to understand the mediation mechanism. Uh, and um, it has some advantages. But at the same time, uh, these approaches do have their limitations. And they, they, they do not assume the sum, assumption that Baron and Kenny assume, but it, it makes some other assumptions. Uh, that's my, uh, my, my talk. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Um, So questions?
Nice slides. Right. That's not mediated by non-compliance. Uh, you mean compliance, the compliance to ART, right? Correct. Yes. So does that mean that don't you have to show that compliance is not affected by alcohol? Uh, no, 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 no. And, you know, I'm... <laughs> So the, the question, I guess your question is, here um, we, we present the natural direct effect, which is 0.13, it's a 30% increase. Um, in, your question is, does it mean that we make the assumption that alcohol use has no effects on adherence, ART adherence? Right, you're, you're imputing no. direct effect of the alcohol. Well, that, that's not right. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, <laughs> <laughs> we basically assume that we must assume that alcohol has some direct effect on adherence so that this is some kind of indirect effect. That's an indirect effect of the alcohol. That's right. So, right. so here is, so think about this mediation mechanism. I guess this, this is the challenging part. So this is definition of the mediation effect. So um, we, we try to tease apart the total effect as the direct effect and indirect effect. Okay, so by definition, by definition, uh, so direct effect is somehow you fix the mediator at some fixed level. Okay, and so this, and, and the, the, the conceptually, we fix this mediator, so the direct effect, uh, as the level, if they do not receive the treatment, if they do not drink uh, alcohol heavily. This is the idea. We kind of compare two potential outcomes. I'm not comparing the two observed outcome, look at two potential outcome. So think about each person has two outcome now. It's each person has two outcome, okay. And suppose, uh, and this two outcome is, one is, for both of them, we fix the mediator at the level if they do not drink heavily, okay. And this person has two outcome, one is I drink the alcohol heavily, one is I do not drink the alcohol at all. And, I, 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 and then I, I compare these two outcome and calculate their difference. But I fixed my mediator as a level. Right, but I'm talking about single, single person. Yeah, I assume that alcohol caused the change of adherence. Right. So yeah. why on that basis, on what how can you conclude alcohol does anything if it could all be mediated by non-compliance? No, no, no. Okay. No, no, no. I, I'm not assuming that's all mediated by uh, compliance. Well why not? Uh, because here is just, analysis shows that alcohol has some direct effect on the um, outcome even you have some kind of a, a, a perfect compliance, maybe some alcohol drug interaction or something. So do you do, so this is, the, there's a direct effect there. Uh, okay. Based on the fact that given a fixed amount of compliance, heavy alcohol use yes. is a higher one. Do you have a separate analysis to show? No, 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 it's just one analysis. You just, so this is a total effect, all right. So this is a total effect from alcohol to the outcome, say viral loads. Uh, increase the viral loads. Right. And this total effects uh, can have direct effects and can have indirect effects. All right, okay. okay. And among those say it's just certain people, the certain people, they are adherent cannot be changed by, by alcohol use. For example, some people may always have poor adherence, no matter drink or not drink. Right. And some people may have, always have good adherence, drink or not drink. So among these people, among these people, there's only direct effect. 
because their mediator cannot be changed. But among the rest of people, their mediator can be changed. So maybe they drink more, then they take the medicine less, uh, less on time. Or maybe the other, the, the other opposite. If they drink more, they take more, <laughs> well, which was unlikely. But among these people, this is a direct effect and indirect effect. All right. So and in this table, just so kind of an average among all these people. So this is the direct effects and the indirect effects. Of course, the indirect effect only happens among those whose, alcohol, uh, whose adherence can be changed by alcohol use. I'm sorry? So the, the time? Over six years. Six years, yeah. So how do you decide? Because at some point, you mediate in the outcome of contemporaneous. You know, so you buy the loads every six months, for example, and you're measuring the drinking every six months. Right. And then you're going forward and doing the same and doing the same. At some point, you have to end that contemporaneous relationship because the mediate Right, that's so right. Are you averaging across? No, no, no. Six months? Uh, you, you kind of average, but uh, but the, the so like the, the time per order is very important. Yeah, so can you just repeat the question? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. I think your question is: We have this longitudinal data, and the data collected over six months, uh, over six years for every six months, and um, yeah, yeah. And um, your question is: Is the the, the causal mediation effects? Uh, I, so I present here is some kind of average over all these repeat measurements, right? Well, I'm just wondering how, you, how you're dealing with that. Are you presenting like an average or maybe 11 times what you could have seen? So you're actually saying mediation and the outcome, final outcome is not contemporary. Yes. Yeah. So how are you dealing with the fact that heavy drinking is the first measure may be less correlated with heavy drinking as the last measure, and so yeah, yeah. also measures become, you know, what, I'm right. just wondering how you're coping with that. Yeah, yeah, I, I see your question. It's, it's a complicated question. So, um, so here, I, I just, if you see this graph, I cannot just focus on one visit, not look at specific like the second, third, or the last visit. So um, the alcohol you use is the, say, let's look at the six month interval. The alcohol use is the value, the, the data we collect, the question we ask at the beginning of the interval. And the clinical outcome is the clinical outcome we measure at the end of the interval. And adherence is the question we ask these people, what happened between in the past six months? So in, it's in the middle, all right? So this time order here, we have this A before M and M before Y, all right? And we look at the specific visit here. Of course, what T, T, minus, T minus one, we have T plus one, and this repeats over time. We should look at specific time interval and look at this, this, uh, this causal uh, mediation mechanism right here, we present it here. Um, as to how to account for this repeat measurements, we're not looking at the, 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 the alcohol use on the outcome six, uh, six years later. I'm just looking at the causal effects on the outcome six months later. I'm looking at the short-term effect. That's why all these very low effects, the, the, the alcohol effect on very low on CD4 counts, that kind of small. The effect's very small, but, but significant, because we are looking at short-term effect. We're looking at the, the six months effect. All right, and because we have this repeat measurements, so we just can somehow kind of lump all data together. But we account for the repeat measurements because we have data, we collect data repeated from these people over six years, and we use the bootstrap to account for that. And we assume that this within person correlation will only affect the standard error estimates, will not bias the results, which is the common assumption. 
for uh, analyzing uh, longitudinal data. Does that answer your question? All right. Of course, this uh, would make some, some kind of strong assumption here. Um, but, I mean, like Louis said, it can be very, very complicated when you have mid repeat measurements. Um, and you have to some, sometimes you have to make some assumption to get the results uh, that's, that's sensible. Any question? It's sort of marginal effects. It's average over the entire population. Like I said, some population, their media cannot be changed. Okay, uh, I guess your question is how to interpre interpret these results. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm just, just for the re recording. Um, so yes, that basically, uh, what you said is basically right. So here I assume that alcohol use cannot, can be manipulated by, but which is a very strong assumption, I, I, I have to say. Um, and this is, say, if in the entire population, say, you stop drinking and they stop drinking, and then in another world, potential world, you say all of you start drinking and drink heavily, and 16% is the difference for the for just looking at the uh, the 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 viral loads, the effect on viral loads, and the 16% can be decomposed as the direct effect, okay, which happened among all uh, all these people, and which uh, that is 3%, this is the population average, and this is 13% indirect effects for the population average. Of course, this population include two people, two, kind, two type of people. One is they are adherent, uh, ARD adherent can be changed by alcohol use. And this are not, the rest people, they are, uh, their adherent cannot be changed. And this 13% is the average among all these people. And we have this paper published last year. Um, if you um, interested, you, you can just stop by. I can send a link of the paper. No question. All right. Okay. All right. All right thanks, Thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, you will have to work with me here because I have two examples in about 30 minutes or so, 35 minutes. So it's going to be hard. Um, so the two examples, one, one of them is, um, is about uh, we compared uh, opioid use versus NSAIDs uh, on uh, persistent uh, pain. And uh, the other one are um, uh, we examined um, the effect of receiving meals on wheels, uh, delivered meals on um, healthcare utilization. So, so each of those problems has their own, each of those studies have their own problems and are kind of like extending uh, the stuff that I've, that I've talked about earlier, but it's actually real. So like for that, I just, uh, I had no, ex no real example. So, so let's think about that. You are uh, driving your uh, nice red car. This is actually my car, my nice red car. I get into a car accident. Uh, there come an ambulance, right? They go to the emergency room. That's what happened. Then you are like, oh, I have like pain in my back. Now the doctors can have two things to give you. Like, yeah, obviously I didn't break anything or uh, other than the car. Um, but then it can give you two things, either like NSAIDs or, or opioids when he release you from, um, from the ER. Uh, usually it's a three days uh, supply of opioids. And then at six weeks, uh, do I have pain? The question is at six weeks, do I still have pain or not have pain? That's, that's, the, that's the question because the idea is that after six weeks, if you're still having pain, you are moving into the chronic pain condition, which is just a bad thing because then you'll like, continue to have medication. So that's, that's the, the story. Um, we have about 948 patients in that study. Uh, 18 to 65, they came after 24 hours to the emergency room. 
Um, and they had to complete the baseline survey. So all of them completed the baseline survey. So this is pretty much what I have in the, um, in the study. Um, so I will try to work with you. There is like the Y opioids that I talked about before. So those that received opioids, I see their outcome. They, they have persistent pain. Uh, they have the y, I have the Y NSAIDs, the same thing. I have their pain for them, but I don't have the pain for those that receive NSAIDs, I don't have their pain for, for opioids, and for those that received opioids, I don't have their pains for NSAIDs. I have their treatment and I have X, and actually there is a slightly even harder problem, what do you do with all those that didn't respond to the survey, the second survey? So I have their baseline values, but I don't know their persistent pain. Uh, those are the one here at the bottom. So I actually don't have their, both their, um, some of them received uh, opioids, some of them received NSAIDs, but they didn't respond to the second survey, so I actually don't know what they're doing. But uh, the way that I'm gonna fix it or like uh, analyze it is just filling in those, mis those, those values because once I fill in those values, pretty much I can ask any question that I wanna ask or at least in the, any causal question that I wanna ask. That's the idea. Uh, and Adam has asked before, uh, what happened when you have also uh, missing covariates? So we actually do have missing covariates. So as every survey that you will give to people, there will be missing covariates. Uh, I will show you about that in a bit. Um, so, so it makes the problem even slightly more complex. Uh, solution, oh, before that I will just show you, just remind you all the stuff that I have here. So these are the missing values, I will call them Y missed, and these are the observed values, and then this is the X observed are the one that are actually observed, and that's the X missed, the one that are in purple. W will be my treatment. The way that I'm gonna solve it is, is looks very simple. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna fill in those missing values and then I'm gonna fill in those, those missing potential outcomes. That's it. That, if you remember anything from this lecture, that's, that's the only thing that I'm doing. I, everything else is, is just mumbo jumbo things. But that's the only thing that I've done. So, um, so the way that I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna create a bunch of data set with uh, non-missing X's anymore, so that's the one thing, and then I'm gonna fill in, one for each of those I'm gonna fill the, the missing potential outcomes uh, multiple times, and then I will have a data set that I can, each of those data sets is pretty much something that I can uh, use and, um, and analyze it separately, and then I can combine the results from it uh, relatively simply, I would say. Well, simply, is, it depends who does it, right? Um, the, the one thing that I will try to adhere here is, is that I'm gonna try to keep the, the design and the analysis separate. And what do I mean by that? I, I kind of like uh, take you back to, my, to what I said before. I'm gonna collect, organize, and analyze all the data without looking at any outcome data. That's the first time. And I will also define the way that I'm gonna do the analysis. And then, I kept it all separately. Actually, I did keep it all separately because part of it was done by um, a grad student. So like I didn't, they, they just like did part of it which I didn't touch and then they gave me the outcome and then I ran the other part. So I actually tried to keep it as, as objective as possible. So that's how, I, that's how we started. We, I told the grad student, throw away the outcome. Like don't have the outcome at all. And that, the reason for that is so they won't create any um, any playing with the data. So like, cause we know what we wanna get, right? Like we wanna say that opioids is bad for you or something of that sort. But I didn't wanna have any of those uh, problem in the, in, the, in, the, in the design. I wanted to think about it completely as a randomized uh, trial. So uh, that's the treatment. The treatment would be, and, and now I have to define the treatment very carefully. So first of all, I had to define it that they were released with either opioids or NSAIDs. Some people are released with none, some people are released with both. But in, for that, that makes the question slightly harder. I'm not gonna show you that analysis. So I'm only gonna take those that are either only opioids or only NSAIDs. At least that's what it shows up on the prescription. So I'm trying to define the treatment very carefully. And then the outcome is actually, before that we talked, everyone talked about outcome and they look at one value, but actually it doesn't have to be one value. There actually are three components for that, for that outcome. So first of all, the one that we are interested in, it was a pain level at six weeks. Is it high or low? The second one is, are you still on medication? So are you still taking opioids at, um, 
it's actually only opioids. The medication here was only opioids. So are you still taking opioids at, um, at six weeks? And it's going to be yes or no. And then, actually, and, and as I said before, we have to like say, um, because some of the people did not respond, which is kind of like a compliance, did they actually answer the survey in the, sec in the six weeks? It's going to be yes or no. Because people who not responding, who did not respond, could have done it for different reasons. They don't have any more pain, and they decided not to respond, or they, um, they still have pain, and they're like, it didn't work for me. I don't want to respond to your survey. So it could be either way. So I, and I don't know. And the only one that I can actually compare are those people that are responding under, that would have responded under both treatments. So that's the, that's the general idea. So I have a three component vectors here. The missing data, so this is like a, a graph of the missing data. So you can see like a bunch of like, I only, I only took like the, there are a bunch more covariates obviously, but I only took the one with the largest uh, parts of the missing. What happened here, what's important is the last line here, which is like, it says 51%. It means that only for 51% of the population have complete data on all the variables that I'm interested in. And that actually is a big service. So only 51% have complete data. The other one have like some different type of missingness along the way. Uh, the largest one was uh, was here, which was um, uh, I forgot what it was. I forgot what it was. The other one was income, that is usually pretty big, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so so we need to fill in this data set. Otherwise, we're going to throw 50% uh, of our population, which is a pretty large number. I'm not going to go exactly how to do that because there is like a, there are current uh, methods to do that. Uh, what we did here and what the grad student did here was actually they used mice, uh, which is multiple imputation by chain equation. This is a way that you go variable by variable and you impute that value and then you go to the next variable and then you impute that value and then you go on in iteratively until you find some sort of convergence. Uh, the only thing that was actually included, there were no outcome in there. And that's, that actually is making an assumption uh, that I'm not uh, going to go into. But generally, if the missingness does not depend on the missing, um, on the missing outcomes, missing outcomes are the missing um, potential outcomes, then we are fine. We are, th that method is still, is still fine. And, and I find it hard to believe why would the missing potential outcomes, which are happening six weeks later, will influence my uh, non-response at baseline. That's the, that's the idea. Okay, so that's, so that's the general idea. So, so now we did the first part, right? Like I showed you that it's easy to do and then we can run that, uh, that software. Uh, it has a packages in, in Stata and, and R if you really wanna uh, go into that. The second part was to make sure that this, uh, that this comparison is probabilistic. And obviously you can see that there are people that are, the red line is, is it's all the logic, this is all the logic scale and what we call the propensity score. I didn't actually explain what the propensity score, but hopefully some of you have heard about it. What it says is that there are some people that cannot be, um, that will only receive end state, that have no, zero chance of receiving end states. There are some people who have uh, zero chance of receiving uh, opioids. Pretty much those are the people uh, in the end there that are, they, are, they came in to the ER and they said, told the doctor, I'm not leaving until you give me opioids, right? And there are those that you come into the ER and they're like, I don't want any opioids. I heard it's bad for me, so just give me whatever else you have. So those are the two, the two uh, units that, that generally uh, we will have to drop. And, and the way that we did it was an iterative process. Again, there is no outcome here because I didn't compare anything about, uh, there was no outcome uh, in the analysis. So it was an iterative process. We, we estimated the propensity score, which is the probability of receiving the treatment, and we continued and did it until we were uh, satisfied every time dropping units that were not um, in either end. Uh, and that's the end result. So the end result is that I have at least, that, that the two populations are relatively, it's not similar, but everyone has, exec, uh, has a non-zero probability at least of uh, receiving one of the treatments. That's the general gist. Uh, and then we check the balance. The iterative process was about checking the balance and we check the balance and you can see the, the differences in um, 
the differences, the blue, light, the blue dots are the differences before any, um, before there was any, uh, any matching or anything else that we have done or subclassification. Uh, and the red line is after we did the subclassification or combined them all, or the red dots is after we did that, and the red line is the zero bias. So there is zero bias in covariates. Again, there is no outcomes here. You can see that the sites were the, the biggest ones, so we tried to create matching within sites, and then we had like uh, baseline pain. Obviously, if you had a big baseline pain, then there, uh, you had higher chance of like receiving opioids and uh, all those other things. Um, and what, we sh what I'm showing you here is that within each of those subclasses, they are relatively similar on average. That's, that's pretty much what I'm trying uh, to show here in, the, in that graph. That's what the balance is doing. And then, now the question was like, what's the, the old, the old idea was to like fill those values. So the second part was to fill up the missing potential outcomes. So the old way that people did that was like using some subclassification. This is like uh, the, this part, this part of the graph that what it does, it does linear regression within each of those subclasses and um, then estimate the effect within of all, of all of those and, and, and take the average. That's the old style. Uh, but you could see that it makes kind of like not sense. Why would I assume that the difference here is like that big and then suddenly here it goes like that big? The propensity score was just like a, an estimated value. It seems more reasonable to like smooth that out and that's what those, um, that's what those values are doing. So that other thing is uh, that we did here is we use like some spline, which is if you want to believe in the doubly robust estimation or whatever else, uh, those things uh, work better. Yeah, I could get into exactly how we did that. Again, it's not it's not that critical. The, the idea here is that we use those. Uh, we impute values within each of those subclasses. That's the general idea. You could do it more fancy method and less fancy methods. So now we have the analysis, but because we have like a three uh, outcome here, what we did is we did, we modeled that. We have to model all those three outcomes. So we did the, uh, re first of all, we, we modeled the response uh, within the first six weeks. So you had to respond. And then the other two, you had to like do, we had, um, did you uh, have pain at six weeks? And then given that you if you had pain and the covariates, we can model are you still using uh, medication at that point? Now it's important, as I said before, that we can only compare among people who would respond under both surveys. I can't re take only, I just, I just described it. So for example, we have uh, in a clinical trial, uh, when you check the quality of life and you're interested in, um, and some people do not respond. It's a cancer trial, some people do not respond. And the control, usually it's an open label trial. Those are people who are pretty sick and they don't respond to quality of life survey. So I can't just like take those that have responded and compare their outcome, <laughs> even though the, st the study was randomized because some people would have responded if they would have been on the treatment. While if they're under control, they are like they decided they are not gonna respond. So the only comparison that I can make is among people who are actually completed both surveys. Okay, so this is the overall results. Uh, the overall results, we couldn't find um, a significant difference in pain between uh, opioids and NSAID. So like the, at least it wasn't significant in, in our, it was positive but not significant. But we did see that people who were started on opioids would still be on opioids. About 17% of the population would still be on opioids at that point. Um, so that's, that's, the general, uh, that's the general finding. Uh, now, because we actually broke it, because I actually now have for everyone, if you remember my, my graph, everyone has actually, I actually have a, their imputed value. What would have happened if they got the other treatment? I can start and look who would have benefited for certain things. So I can like start and look, oh, are the proportions of, fe are, are females more inclined to uh, respond under, um, to have no pain under opioids or, or not? Or I can like, I can start looking and, and finding who are the people who are more uh, responsive for a certain type of treatment, who, they, who have pain under both, who had no pain. Uh, we did, couldn't find any, any, any significant differences, uh, but it could be that we either looked at the wrong uh, variables or we, uh, or we don't have enough people. That's uh, the general idea. Now, I had a question earlier. Oh, what happened when you are 
uh, you, that you might have missed something, right? Those that are using opioids might have, um, might have been uh, more prone to use opioids. Maybe they're opioids user anyhow to start with, and therefore when they come in, the doctor just give them opioids so they will go away, or all those other things that, I, that weren't recorded in the survey. So the one thing I, I, we could do about it is to have a sensitivity analysis. And how would we have a sensitivity analysis for that? I could like think about a, a, a variable that has, um, that, has a certain, that has a certain value uh, difference between those, two, between those two groups. So for example, under the control, it's gonna come from a zero one distribution and under the treatment, it's gonna come from a mu one distribution. So that much, how much bias do I ex expect on average between on this variable? And then I could say, well, because I'm imputing those outcomes, I could say, well, how strong is the effect of those outcome would be if I, uh, which is, this is a conditional um, log odds ratio, this row, how, how strong could it be to change my results? That's pretty much the idea. And they were hounding me down for those, uh, for the presentation, and the only thing that I was trying to do was get those nice graphs down. It took me a long time to do them. Um, so I really like them. That's <laughs> um, so what do we see in those, uh, in those graphs? So, so the first one is, is severe pain. And what I'm trying to show, these are like p-value. These are two-sided p-value. So I'm trying to like see how strong that, how different does this covariate has to be and how strong does it have to be to change my results. So black is when I've changed my results significantly. And if you could see, the bias has to be at least 1.5, 1.5 standard deviations. If you have a bias that big, get a different data set. That's pretty much my, my advice. If you have a data set, if you have something that big, that bias that big on a covariate, 1.5 is, is known in the literature. That's, that's a, you need a different data set. Uh, but anyhow, even so, if you have a 1.5, you still need to have a, an odds ratio of, oh, sorry, um, a log odds ratio, which is um, a conditional log odds ratio of minus one. So if any of you know logistic regression and if you have a coefficient that is minus one on a, on a centralized variable, that's huge. That's like you, you hit the jackpot. Like I don't know a lot of those that appear around or two. That, so, so you can see that it's gonna be very hard to change the pain value even if we had that covariate. That's the, for the pain. For the opioids, what we have is the other way around because we had a significant result. So now the question is, how much do I need to change, how much do I need to change that variables to like actually observe some differences? So I want, so the black is staying within that same region, the same significant results. And then those values here is how much do I need to change, how much that variable has to like interfere that I would, um, uh, that I will have, uh, that I will have a non-significant result. Again, we, we see that you have to be very, very big. Either a very, very strong effect, a conditional odds ratio of 1.5, which is huge, or, and then one, and you still have to have like a one, um, a bias of one, which is again, very big. So generally, very, very hard to change those results. So I have to like have something extremely, extremely, uh, that I haven't thought about, that haven't been recorded, and will change the results that we actually have. Okay, so I know, how, how long do I have? I have a lot of time, okay, great. So now I can go to the next, okay. So, so what do we find here? Um, we found that, that patients that are released with opioids or NSAIDs have probably similar amount of pain at six weeks, which is good. That means that you can release them with one or the other and probably do well. Uh, and there's the, those that are uh, released with opioids probably have higher propensity to use it. So if you think that they are still using opioids at six weeks is a bad thing, then probably you should release them less with that. That's the general idea. We are trying to get into like creating uh, in a, a more sophisticated tool to ask the question why, why is it so? So for example, there are people who respond, it's interesting, so the survey says that they have problem, uh, a GI, problem with, uh, with hey, receiving NSAID, they still were released with NSAID. It's a bad idea, right? Like they will still do bad, we expect them to do bad uh, at, um, at six weeks because they, they, we didn't solve their pain. But that happens in the ER. I don't know how it did, but it does happen. We can see it in our data. Um, so, so we're trying to create a tool that like will try to help that and then check that how this tool is effective, but uh, that's a future 
uh, thing that needs to get funded, I guess. OK. So all of this analysis, which looks simple, right, because I just did it myself and ran with like a few slides with no, uh, uh, with no code or anything, um, is good if we had all of the variables together in the same file. Uh, we can make it more complex, and one of the ways that we make it more complex, so for example, in this study, if, where we are examining the Mills and Wills receipt, we actually are having it in two different separate files. So one file includes, uh, is coming from a Mills and Wills uh, data sets that says, um, do we have, um, did you receive Mills and Wills, and then there is some other characteristics, uh, are you living alone, and, and other things like that. And the other files that we're interested in uh, is the Medicare files that has uh, utilizations, Medicare utilization, healthcare utilization. They're both coming from two separate files. Now, if I had everyone's social security number for both files, then I would hopefully be in a good place if there were no errors, because I can match the people that are in the Mills and Wills data sets to the people who are in the Medicare file, which is great. But my researcher, my collaborators decided to make it more complex for me, so I actually don't have that social security. So the only thing that I have is some, some demographic characteristics, which is their, oh, I can actually show you what they are. Do I have it? Yeah, I have it in a second. I will show you in a second. So what's the question? The question is um, how mills and wills are affecting healthcare utilization. Uh, the data sources that I had were uh, 51,000 Mills and Wills clients when, from 13 sites, and we have ma uh, Medicare Master Beneficiary file uh, with a bunch of like things about your claims and your chronic condition data. We made sure that everyone is above 66 because if you are not uh, you are not above 66, then you're probably not going to be in the Medicare file. I can search for you forever, but you're probably not going to be there. Um, and then, so that has to like reduce some of the clients. We had to like remove like about 12,000. So we have about 29,000 uh, of the initial cohort. The thing that I can combine those two people is their nine digit zip codes, their full date of birth, their gender and their race. Both of those uh, variables appear in, in those two files. Uh, hopefully they are recorded the same way. That's, that was the hope. Um, because if they do, then I can create those, uh, those exact matches, right? Like if you live at that same address, nine digit zip code, it's pretty much a block level in the city, and you are the same gender, the same race, and I got your date of birth exactly right down, you probably got you right. Um, the problem is, it doesn't happen. So this is what happens. For someone to match on all of those variables together, only 40% of the population match on that exact one. And then, so I said, okay, well, race might not be recorded very well. So I will drop race, gender, uh, date of birth, the nine digit zip code bring me to 52%. So I'm still only 50% of my population is matched exactly. Okay, so I can drop your gender. Maybe you got your gender wrong in one of those files. I'm getting to 52.8, so not much difference there. So I will ba bring back gender, I will remove it to eight digit zip code. I'm getting to 56%. And I can go on and on and make it less and less restrictive. What happened is that as I get, I get more exact matches, I can get up to 73 here with like your date of birth and your six digit zip code. But uh, first of all, I'm increasing more people that are wrongly matched. And second, I'm only at 73%. So that's not, that's not a great thing, right? Like if I match you on an exact date of birth and exact uh, six digit zip code. So we need to do something better than that. So what do we do better than that? Uh, one way is, is to assume that I'm allowing for some error. So like maybe you recorded your date of birth slightly wrong. Like that means you were supposed to be 1970, uh, 1953 and now you are 1952 actually. Somebody put three instead of two uh, or somebody uh, switched the 25 and the 52 or stuff like that. Um, so we are allowing for some errors in that um, in, those, in those values, and what, I, what we're trying to do is take all possible uh, links. So we have, one we have one file of the Medicare file with all the possible people that we decided to keep them within a certain uh, five-digit zip code, so it's within a certain area. 
And then we are trying to match them with all the possible people that could be matched within that other side. So it gives me all possible pairwise combinations. And all these pairwise combinations come from a mixture, a mixture of either the ones that I got right that are true matches and those that are false matches. Okay, once I got, so uh, the only thing that I need to find is who are those false matches from all the possible pairs and who are the true matches from all the possible pairs. And once I do that, I can like say, oh, those are that are true matches or like seems to be like true matches. I can say, oh, those are the one that I'm gonna use in my analysis. That's pretty much the idea. When we do that, we get to a linkage. Uh, so remember we had like a, the exact linkage was about 73%. We actually increased our linkage to about 85%. Uh, so we got 12 more, we, we gained 12 more people, but actually in more systematic way than just like, oh, I will try to do this or I will try to remove this and, and try to do the matches in different ways. Now, that's not exact because I don't know for all those people that they are, that this is the actual people that are, that, are, that are true matches. So I have to account for those errors. There are people that I know exactly. They matched on that date of birth. They match on that zip code. Everything was exactly true matched. So there, those people I know that they are exact. Those are about the 40%. The other ones, I don't know. I have to like start seeing, okay, some of those I trust more, some of those I trust less. I will let the algorithm decide. But once I do that, I have to account for that variability. So instead of just like, saying, oh, all those people are, I know exactly who they're matched to, I'm actually creating a bunch of, of, again, it's another sort of like imputation telling you, oh, these are the people that are gonna be matched in this data set, these are the people that are gonna be matched in this data set, these are gonna be the people that are gonna be matched in this data set. Some of those are matched exactly the same way all of the time, some of those are changing, coming in and out. Okay, so um, there are assumptions that are attached to that that I'm not gonna get into all of those, Generally, it's that, that the receive of, of treatment is independent from the variables that I use for the matching. That's, that the errors are independent. The errors in the matching are independent of their actual receipt uh, of that uh, value. It's a big assumption, but, but I will live with that. So we are left with 85% of the population. Uh, to actually do those calculations, I have to drop all those people who have Medicare Advantage because for them, I don't actually have their healthcare utilization. So I got their right match, but I don't have their right, but I don't know how much they're actually utilizing. So I have to drop those people out. Um, so this is what we can see from the linkage result. So among those uh, Mills on Wheels uh, recipients, we can see, for example, how many of them have hypertension now, how many of them have anemia, and all of those I can get, only get from the Medicare file. I couldn't get it before because I couldn't, I only had their Mills and Wills data set. Okay, so we're almost done, right? The easy part. So I already did the matching, now I found the right people, so for every one of those files that I imputed the matches, I now have to impute their potential outcome. What would have happened if they didn't receive Mills and Wills? That's the other way around. And that's what we do again. So again, I impute that. But, but here, as you can see, I actually don't impute the bottom part. What is the bottom part? The bottom part are all those people that, that, that uh, could have received meals on wheels but did not receive meals on wheels. And this is kind of like less of an interest. We are, we are talking about estimates here. This is about the population, among the population who received meals on wheels, who have a chance to receive meals on wheels, what would be their outcome. The other part is kind of like less of importance, so we actually, I kept it aside. And that, that's talk about the average treated on the treated. Some, some people will define it this way. Again, I have to have some more assumption there uh, that we talked about before, that we started with the, the, the stable unit treatment value assumption, and then we have to have like unconfounded as well. Blah, blah, we did some matching. Uh, I can show you how, how well do we do the matching. So, so this is, these are all, uh, the values, the, the triangles are the pretreatment and the circles are the actual treatment and we can see that we reduce the, our um, bias on all those variables, like how much you use SNF and how much you use and all your uh, chronic conditions and um, whatever else we had there and how much you use home coast and how much you have been to the ER before and all those other things in the days before, we kind of like reduced it to be relatively similar. The matching is actually pretty complex but I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, what we do see is that um, actually if you receive mills and wheels, you have higher chance of like being in the ER and uh, using post and, um, and have acute hospitalization in the, in the 30 days afterwards. 
That's not what they wanted to hear, uh, but that's the data. Like now, now you could say, well, it could be that those people were uh, different um, people at that point and we can run the same sensitivity analysis that I've done before. Uh, or you could say that actually that's what we would expect to happen because you are homebound senior that are, that are not doing well in the first place, that's why you're getting meals on wheels. Somebody comes to your house, see that you're not doing well, they're trying to send you to the hospital. They're trying to tell you that you should go to the ER. Something like that could happen. So we see increased utilization because of that. That's not a bad thing, depending on how you define bad or good, but that's not a, necessarily a bad thing. Okay, so I'm almost out of time. Uh, okay, so what we see is that they're doing better after receiving. So if I just compare them doing before and after, the same Mills and Wills recipients, they're doing better after than before, but that's not a surprising idea that they, they are, they are, they are, they are doing better, that's why they receive meals on wheels in the first place. They're on a good trajectory, that's what I meant. And, but we do see that they're using more ER and more uh, inpatient use uh, 30 days following. Uh, okay, now all those things, again, I could have done the same stuff with, uh, Adam is here and we did some stuff for him with like survival and, uh, and uh, survival analysis, we can do an imputation there. Uh, I showed you a sensitivity that I hope that you like. I don't know if you do, but I did. Um, and then uh, it's very easy once you do those imputation, once you impute those values, the analysis becomes very easy because it's something that we are used to be doing. Just need to do it uh, in a smarter way. Okay, good. I'm in of my time, right? No, we have 10 minutes. 10 minutes, good. So I'm, I'm pretty much on time. Questions? Yes. So were we in the second example, can you discuss why or why not um, take a propensity score approach to try to understand better whether that second example is to be compounded? To be what why do it? Yes. In other words, use the methods that you used in the first study to address the questions in the second study. Yes, so the question was uh, that I used the, why, if, if I, you can use the method in the first study to the method in the second study. Ira, you know me as a pretty consistent person, right? So I usually use the same method. <laughs> Actually, that's what we did. We, we, the, the only thing that we, were, we used propensity score to do those matching. So to get that, to get this, this is based on propensity score. So we actually use the propensity score um, in the, on all those variables, because there are a lot of variables. The only thing that we added here, which was slightly different than the previous one, is that we required exact matching on certain stuff. So we wouldn't want to have people with, from two different zip codes that are not in the same zip code, or the five-digit zip code. But yeah, we use exactly the same stuff. We, the only thing here, we did the, some sort of matching, so the analysis after the imputation afterwards would be slightly better. So there is a matching that is happening, but then there is an imputation that comes afterwards. Does this make, does this answer the question? Yes, let me ask a slightly different question. Okay. Um, why is it that you can't look uh, at um, factors which make it, which drive people to have meals on wheels um, and Uh, the only variables that I have are the ones that, that I have. So like those are the one in the Medicare data set slash the one that the Mills and Will supplied us. Uh, the ones that Mills and Will, uh, well, I will say that. The ones that Mills and Will supplied us, it does not help me much because it doesn't tell me about people who haven't received Mills and Will. Because they only tell me about the people who are. So the only variables that I can do the matching is whatever appears right, in so the I Medicare. Think, so that last point I think is the most important. Yeah. So, so the one, the one that, that are in the Mills and Wills only tells me what there is Mills and Wills, but it doesn't tell me about, um, but even so, Mills and Wills, it's, it's coming from different facilities, so they report like, even, even their, I would say that, how, how much did you serve each person is not very accurate. Like some said, oh, we give them two twice a week, we give them daily, sometimes they don't even tell you that, they just say he's on our list. Um, all those things are kind of like murky uh, as you get into that. Um, 
But yes, to, in order to compare to those that are not, I have to like, look, the only thing that I have is the Medicare file. So it's as, it's as good. Obviously, we see that they are different. They're, those are very special people. The one on Mills and Wills are very special. I have to say that. They are like, it was extremely hard to get to that, uh, to this balance. It's, uh, they are a lot sicker. They, uh, they use the, they, they use healthcare a lot before. So they are, they are really, really different people. So in the end, you come up to like, you look at, oh yeah, I can find matches in all the Medicare file. Actually not, this is like, this is a very, very uh, finely tuned uh, process. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's an excellent that's an actually an excellent question. Um, there, there are two things. So, so first of all, I could believe that those that are the forty percent, they are they are good matches. But those uh, kind of like inform me what type of matches should I see, right? I could like throw them away. That's fine. It just changes my probability a bit. Uh, I could I could drop them a bit. Uh, I could drop them out because they are not going to change. They are not they are not helping me in, in estimating those those values. But I could, I could use them because I would say that. The 40% does not help me much. The one underneath helped me a lot. Does this make more sense? Oh, yeah, I would, I would get, I would get this. Because the 40% the is usually not going to change. In, my, in, my, in this whole procedure, this like mixture model procedure, what would happen that the cutoff will always keep those 40% at the same place. They will always be matched exactly the same. The only problem is the one that are, the another 45% extra. So you can think about uh, the, okay, so this, this is an excellent question. So think about the probability, we look at two probabilities that are happening here. There is a probability that, that, two, set, that two records, one from each file is a, is a match, and there is a probability that they are not a match. Okay, that's the two probability that I'm gonna try and estimate. And, and the way that they are a match, it's like saying, how many of those variables are you a good match on? Okay, some of those are stronger. So, for example, gender, I hope that, like, is a better predictor, for example, than, like, error in the date of birth. So, the, so now the question is, I have to, like, order it in a way that will tell me where would be this, this cutoff. There is a threshold that has to say, what's the ratio that I agree that, like, uh, that you are a match versus the fact that you are not a match? What's the good ratio for cutting, for creating a cutoff? Now, as I said, it's an estimation process, so I have to account for the error in the estimation. That's why I have to like, create a bunch of, uh, a bunch of data sets and, and, it, and adjust for it. But what would happen in those data sets is that 40% are usually stuck there. They're not going to change. The only other ones that are going to change are the other 45. Some of those actually will not even change there. Because if you only had a, an error in the race, you might not even have an influence. Yes? Well, random is, is a good is a good question. What you're asking is is if my if those variables that I have are enough to like tell me the difference. Okay, that's that's pretty much the, the, the question to, to find the right person. So that's why I allow for those errors, right? Like because I do agree that there are some errors there that I don't know that are dependent on their date of birth, that are depending on their rate. I don't I'm not assuming that they're depending on some other on other variables. Right, but I you could you could start assuming that the errors don't depend on on your exactly right. 
Exactly right. Or not necessarily outcome, but, but other variables that increase in, in, in either of their files. You're you are exactly right. This is a big assumption that, well, actually, oh, I have zero yes, time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There, you are, I, I totally agree. So, so this is an assumption that most people actually don't know when they use those type of methods, is that you are assuming that they are not, they are not correlated with other uh, variables. We have better methods for that, too. Like, we could do that, too. Sometimes it makes stuff more complex, sometimes it makes stuff less complex, but, but we can do that too. We have, we have done that, like for example, in um, date of reason for death and uh, your expenditures in the last six months of your life. So those two things are correlated, and you could use that to like, find better matches, even though they are not the same variable. So, so those are like the newer methods that we have been uh, using lately. Okay, I'm zero, so I have to like fall away. <laughs> Hi, I'm Isa. So I'm going to talk to you about what to do when you have a trial that's completed and you want to find out what the results would be if you applied the treatments to a new population. Okay. So bef before I go forward, actually, for how many people here was reviews um, Roy's first presentation, almost entirely a review. Don't be shy, because I, I need to get a feel. Okay. 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 So some of this is going to be rough, okay? But I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll handhold. Okay. So I have to show you this slide. The important bullet is the last one. Um, this is really work in progress, so any comments I'm very interested in. And I'm also very interested if you have uh, cases where you think the methods might uh, apply. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'll set up the problem first intuitively, then a little more formally, then I'll talk about study design. Then I'll try to tell you how to estimate the effect of the treatment that was used in the trial, if it were applied outside the trial. And I'll show you a small simulation study to convince you that the stuff I say is almost correct. And then I'll show you an application in actual data in a very unique study. Okay. Okay. I have to scroll apparently, so I'm sorry for that. Okay. So the problem. Here I can. My effects are not working because of all the scrolling. Okay. So almost everyone who knows a little bit about clinical medicine knows the people in the trial, any given trial, are highly selected. And they do not represent, not even the people who are trial eligible, who just happen not to be in the trial, but are seen in clinical practice. So in this talk, I'm going to talk, to call the people who are not in the trial, but who would be eligible for the trial, the target population, okay? So even if you have a very high quality trial, everything was done perfectly in the trial, a population average treatment effect obtained in the trial will not apply to the target population most of the time if there is effect heterogeneity by the covariates that you, that drive people into your trial, okay? So people have an intuition about this and they say the results from the trial do not transport or do not generalize or do not apply to the target population. So I'm going to show you how to fix that. And there is a fine print here under certain assumptions, okay? okay. So, First, I'll tell you how to collect your data, and then we'll talk about causal inference and then about statistics, okay? So the cleanest example I can come up with, I call a trial nested within a cohort of eligible individuals. Sometimes these things in the clinical literature go by the name uh, comprehensive cohort studies. So basically, you start by identifying people in your source population who meet your trial eligibility criteria. And then you collect baseline covariates from everyone, and again, such studies have been done. And then once you get that baseline data, sometimes from routinely collected data sources, you ask the people whether they wish or do not wish to be randomized. And the randomization in everything I say can be either marginal, the flip of a simple coin, or it can be conditional on measured covariates. And then, because the people who don't consent, you're not allowed to follow up, you're left with treating and following up only the people who consent to randomization. Okay, so that's how it looks. 
there is a hypothetical superpopulation of eligibles from which you obtain a study sample. Some of them consent and some of them do not consent to randomization. Okay. So this is how the observed data looks like. I'm just counting people here, so this is just a counter. I use S to denote whether someone is in or outside the randomized trial. So S1 will be the set of people who consented, and zero will be the people who did not consent. Then treatment information is available only for the people I randomized. It's zero, I'll keep calling zero control, and one treated, though the names are nothing. They're just placeholders, labels for the zero one. And then I observe data only for the people, for, on the outcome, for the people in the trial, and this is missing here for the people outside the trial. And I have a bunch of baseline covariates collected on everyone. In everything I say, you can think of X as extremely high dimensional. 1,000, 1 million covariates, okay? As many as you can get, the better, okay? So to simplify exposition, I'm going to ask you to work with me as if the trial could be done perfectly, okay? Only the trial. So to get us started, I'll assume everyone was perfectly adherent, uh, and this came up earlier, I think. I'll assume there was no dropout in the trial, no measurement error, and no direct effect of participation on the outcome, not through treatment, okay? Each of these assumptions is pretty strong. Each of these assumptions, if you ask me, I can tell you how to fix in actual applications. But because describing the transportability ideas cleanly would be impossible if we also had to deal with all these trial-specific complications, for now, I ask you to ignore them. Okay? If you're interested about these things, ask me. Okay. So I built a, a little bit on what Roy introduced in the morning. I use these potential outcomes, and maybe to tease Roy a little bit, I'll use potential outcomes and counterfactuals interchangeably. Roy doesn't like that. Okay. Oh, I thought. <laughs> so, um, but I'm going to use the same definition, okay? These Y superscript little a sub i's are the values of the outcome in the person had they received a particular treatment, which I denote little a. Again, in this example, I'm going to use a zero and one treated and controlled, but really everything I show you can be generalized to even continuous treatments. Okay, so when we have the nested structure that I just described where the trial is nested within a cohort of eligibles, it's natural to want to know what would happen if I treated or not treated everyone, both who participated and did not participate in the trial and then take the average. And as Roy said, I will work with superpopulation inference only, so I'm only considering what happens if you get really, really, really big sample sizes? Again, this tends to simplify things a little bit. It's also natural, after the trial is done, to ask what would be the treatment effect, comparing treatment and control, for the people not in the trial. That's the subset S0. So this we might call the marginal, and this the conditional on S equals zero, causal contrast, okay? Now, the, both of these are interesting. They're not equally interesting when we use what I'll call an artificial composite data set. So, I mean, from all the trials you've read, almost never do you get a trial nested within a cohort of eligibles. Usually you just get a trial, right? So in that case, you can make what I call an artificial composite data set. So that's a data set that's created by appending the completed trial from a sam to a sample of people from the population you're interested in, who would be eligible for the trial, okay? So to make this very concrete, someone somewhere ran a trial and you're interested in what would happen if you used the treatments in that trial in your target population. Then I assume you have a way of getting a possibly historical or from routinely collected data or design a study to collect baseline covariate information for people who would be eligible for the trial and who are representative of the population of patients you see in your practice, okay? Super concrete example is a trial was completed 
let's say, in elderly, so it's a trial that randomized drug A versus drug B in over 65, I might use, let's say, and it's a cancer drug, so I might use Sir Medicare to obtain historical data on patients over 65 who would meet the trial eligibility criteria, but who were not treated. Okay, they don't have to be treated in the historic sample. Okay. When you create this artificial data set, and by create, I just mean you put one under the other and you line up the X's so that they are the same. The, this mean effect is not really useful. The reason it's not really useful is if you think about it, that effect is marginalizing, let's say, over AIDS. But the people in your sample from the non-trial participants might be much older than the people in the trial, even if they both meet the eligibility criteria. So that will mean you're drawing inferences for a population where the AIDS distribution is an artificial mixture of the people in the trial and the target, okay? So when you have artificial composite data sets, it's much more interesting to think about this causal contrast, which is what would be the treatment effect had I applied the treatments that were used in the trial if I use them in my target population, in the uh, target population I formed from my practice or from routinely collected data. Okay. Because of this asymmetry, artificial composite data sets are really useful only for one uh, causal contrast. I'll be focusing on that causal contrast. If you happen to have a comprehensive cohort study, meaning if you happen to have a trial actually nested in a cohort of eligibles, email me. Okay, we have everything done, there is a paper in review, but it's just much more common to do this, okay? So I'll focus on this, but the idea is transfer. Okay, so how are we going to identify and estimate the effect of treatment on the non-participants? Okay. So I use the same tricks Roy introduced in the morning, just conditional on S equals zero. So. I'm interested in this quantity, but because of a thing called linearity of expectation, that's the same as being interested in each of these potential outcome means. It might be useful to talk through what this is. Well, this is the mean of the outcome had everyone been treated of the people not in the trial. And that's the mean of the outcome had everyone been not treated among the people not in the trial. Okay. So this makes my life a lot easier because I have to worry about identifying each of these means, and I'm going to call them potential outcome or counterfactual outcome means, okay, for each of the treatments of interest. Okay. So now come the assumptions, and I think one important benefit of the framework we've been using all day is that we can list all the big causal assumptions up front. It's, listing them doesn't make them plausible, but it allows informed debate on their plausibility. So I'll list them first, and then I'll talk about the big ones, which are the last two, and then we'll critique them. Okay. So the first, it's part of what Roy called sutva. I like to call it consistency, but it basically means if someone actually got treatment little a, and whenever you see little a, if it's confusing, you can think either of zero or of one. Okay. I just use little a to mean both of them. So for someone who actually gets treatment little a, the observed outcome equals the counterfactual outcome under the treatment they actually receive. Okay. Most of the time this is reasonable if you don't have interference and no versions of treatment. Okay. So now in the trial, it's very reasonable to make these two additional assumptions. This one says the mean of the potential outcome is independent of the treatment actually received, possibly conditional on baseline covariates, but notice how both sides are only among the people in the trial. I think intuitively it makes sense that this assumption is given by randomization. It's weaker than the independence that you get by randomization, but I just want to state the minimal assumptions here. Okay. And then positivity of treatment assignment just means every person in the trial had a non-zero chance of getting both of the treatments I'm interested in, possibly conditional on covariates. Both of these we get by randomization, right? Because we would not really assign people 
by using a coin that sometimes says you cannot be treated. For certain covariate values says they cannot get one of the treatments. So the top three kind of reasonable, these two by design, actually. Okay. So now, these are the big assumptions the methods I'm going to introduce depend on. Okay. So the first one is a kind of transportability of the conditional potential outcome mean from the trial to the target. Okay, and we'll critique that one in a little bit. The fifth one, the last one, is that there is no covariate value that's important for mean transportability that makes you unlikely to be in the trial, right? So basically, we cannot transport from the trial to people who are completely ineligible for the trial, okay? So these two assumptions are the critical assumptions for the method. Informally, mean transportability means we know enough covariates to determine the outcome so that trial participation itself doesn't give us information. I'm a little informal here. And I think quickly we can admit this is often implausible. Sometimes there is what people call the Hawthorne effect, which is being in the trial affects how you report your outcome. Maybe there is incomplete knowledge of the outcome mechanism, so I cannot collect enough Xs for that independence condition to hold, the mean independence. Or maybe I know them, but I just didn't measure them, okay? For this assumption, if you believe it's implausible, the best strategy, I think, is to do sensitivity analysis. Now, I won't talk about sensitivity analysis any more except this. I think the proper sensitivity analysis tries not to assume anything specific about the unmeasured variables and should be done using the most efficient possible estimator. So I have derived that, and there is a paper in preparation, but I won't show you anything more than, other than to say it's possible to do very general, very efficient sensitivity analysis. Okay. So the second big assumption, the fifth one in the original list, is positivity of trial participation. This is a little milder in the sense that if you do your job of selecting the target population properly and excluding people who would be ineligible for the trial, it is often close to being plausible. There is ways of testing this one under certain model assumptions, and there is also um, certain remedial measures that you can take, but this discussion gets pretty technical very quickly, so I'll just say it's possible Ask me later, okay? Okay, so now we're done. In Roy's template, we state the assumptions. We said what are the causal quantities we wanted to estimate. We have a task now for re-expressing them in terms of the observed data, okay? So the left-hand side of this is the, each of the means I'm interested in for a little a1 and little a0. The left-hand side is hopeless, right? Because it depends on the things that in Roy's slide were always question marks. I cannot get them. The right-hand side, though, is very nice. Everything on the right-hand side belongs to the list of variables I showed you in the table of observed data, right? We said we have Xs on everyone, and this just is the indicator for being in the trial. Then I know the treatment status of everyone who was in the trial. And then for the people who are not in the trial, this way of writing this thing is just using the Xs, so the baseline covariates. So even if it's not immediately obvious, everything on the right-hand side is in the, in the, can be identified from the observed data, okay? So basically here I should have a bright red line because this is where the causal inference ends, okay? No more potential outcomes from here on because we succeeded in re-expressing the potential outcome mean as a quantity that is only about the observed data, okay? So from now on, we put a different hat on, the statistical hat, okay? So I want to estimate this thing. This is called a functional of the observed data distribution. It's not important. It's a thing that depends only on the observed data, okay? So before our work, people had attempted extrapolation, obviously. So the ideas that existed in the literature were of two flavors. The first one is to take the people who are in the trial and who get treatment little a, 
so each of the arms in the trial, build some kind of model in there and use that model for the people outside the trial. That's very, very, very similar to Roy's imputation uh, strategies. The second flavor of strategies was to somehow model the probability of being in the trial and possibly of getting the treatment, although you don't need that because the trial is randomized, and using that to construct weights to estimate the mean that we're interested in, each of the means we're interested in. Okay. So I, I, I will show you these things. There is a few formulas, but they make complete sense if you trust me for a little bit. Okay? So basically, I need a model for the mean of the outcome, conditional on the baseline covariates, in the people in the trial who got each of the treatments I'm interested in. Okay? Now, if you somehow are omniscient and you know X is low dimensional, you can do non-parametric estimation here. Okay? Most of the time, you worry, you add many, many Xs in your analysis, the curse of dimensionality catches up with you, so you have to use some kind of model. Now, here I take the extreme position of saying you use a parametric model, okay? I, I do this because most people are familiar with parametric models, so now I can tell you this basically says take the fitted value from a linear regression of the outcome on covariates in the treated people in the trial, okay? Between completely non-parametric estimation and fully parametric estimation, there is a range of options, machine learning, flexible regression, what have you. There are technicalities about using these more flexible methods for the old estimators. Many of these technical difficulties go away when we get to the newer methods. So for now, let's talk about parametric models that we all love and are familiar with. This is just linear regression, okay? Linear regression of Y on X in the people in the trial. So this just says, well, build that model, predict on everyone who was not in the trial, and average the numbers. This is just dividing by the number of people not in the trial, okay? So it's an easy exercise to show that if you get that model right, if you correctly specify the model for the expectation of the outcome, this quantity here will converge to what you are interested in, okay? We can think of this as a regression-based extrapolation, or, or a single imputation analysis. If you like multiple imputation, you could actually do this multiple times and use that to estimate the uncertainty. Okay. So this was my co-PIs, Liz Stewart's idea, um, roughly. Um, so basically what Liz said is why don't we use the S, the indicator for being in the trial, and the baseline covariates to build a model for the probability of participating in the trial, okay? So again, I use a parametric model for the probability of being in the trial given baseline covariates, okay? And then I added this little thing which is to also model the probability of treatment even though you know it uh, in an actual randomized trial, nothing bad happens to you if you model it, um, at least in large trials. Okay, so basically, this is what we might call a propensity score in the trial, and this is the probability of being in the trial. Okay, o both of these you can get from the observed data. And then you construct this weight, which is a weird thing. In the numerator, it has one minus the probability of being in the trial, which is the same as the probability of not being in the trial. The bottom is the probability of being in the trial times the probability of getting the treatment you actually got. The reason it's the probability you actually got is because for each treatment, I only use the data for the people who got that actual treatment, okay? So we might call this the inverse odds of participation weight because this part is the inverse odds of participation, and then this is just nothing. It's the inverse of the probability of treatment, okay? So turns out if you take the observed outcomes, you use those weights for the people on, in the trial who got the treatment little a, and they average by the number of people in, in the, not in the trial, you get what you want. The requirement is that you can correctly specify these two models. 
Now, the bottom model is easy because you, as Roy said, know the assignment mechanism in the trial. You could even plug in the true value. Yeah. This one is harder. You have to have substantive knowledge to create a model for the probability of participation in the trial condition along covariates. But if you get th this one right, this estimator will converge to the quantity we are interested in. Okay. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it actually makes a big difference in terms of the variance of what you would get if you try these methods out. So it just happens that instead of using this, if you use the sum of the weights, you usually get estimators with much smaller variance. This is a property that has been known since at least 1971 from the survey literature. And sometimes this is referred, for people familiar with surveys, as the Hadzek or ratio estimator. Okay. So it's not important why. It's just a fact of life. Most of the time, you get better behavior if you normalize the weights to sum to one. That, what this term does is it normalizes the weights to sum to one. Okay. What's nice about this is there is a way to implement this on the computer without doing, with doing zero, almost zero programming, okay? So basically you get the weights like I showed you here. You get these weights, which is just by logistic regression basically if you use parametric models. And then you run a regression of Y on A using those weights only for the people in the trial. And it just happens that's how regression works on the computer the intercept that this weighted regression will spit out is the mu zero version of this, and the slope is the difference of mu one and mu zero. So if you just sum the intercept and the slope, you get mu one, okay? So I think this is very convenient if people want to use IP weighting, inverse odds of participation weighting uh, for transportability, okay? So this is where things might get a little more interesting, okay? Because this was basically review. So, can we do better than these two estimators? Okay, so the way I define better now is I'm going to create estimators that are more efficient than inverse odds weighting because inverse odds weighting tends to produce very large standard errors. But while doing that, I also gain some robustness to model misspecification because the two estimators we reviewed, inverse odds weighting and the outcome regression one, they rely critically on getting the models correctly specified. Okay. So there is a connection here with the theory of semi-parametric missing data, and I'm not going to show you. Okay. I'm just going to give you a hand wavy explanation. Some smart people in the 70s and then later in the 90s created a machine. Okay. You go to this machine with questions about observed data quantities, sometimes with a causal interpretation as we're doing here. And what the machine does is it spits out answers with desirable properties. This is a very heterogeneous audience, so I'll just say, basically this is the machine that tells you what is the influence function, okay? For those in the know, this means something. For everyone else, you don't need it, okay? So it just happens when I give the mean that we're interested in to that machine, it spits out this thing, okay? Now, on first look, it looks nasty, okay? It's much longer than the others. But then if we pay close attention, it, we are, can actually see that it's some kind of interesting combination of the two estimators we already saw, right? Over here is the kernel of the, the summand, basically, of the uh, outcome regression estimator, over here, if, we, if you do the multiplication, you get the summand of the uh, inverse odds weighting estimator, and then there is a weird subtraction of the model of the outcome. This is where the magic happens and efficiency is increased and you gain so-called double robustness. Double robustness is a mathematical property, not a matter of belief, if I may say so, Roy. Uh, it's a mathematical property of the things the machine spits out most of the time. Not always, many times, okay? What's beautiful about this thing is you might get this model wrong or you might get this model wrong and you might not know which of the two you got wrong, but as long as the other is correct, this thing will converge to the true answer in large samples, 
So that's kind of a desirable property. Okay. This is, again, just a small dressing up. If I normalize the weights to sum to one, the finite sample variance will often go down. This will behave a little more stably if I normalize the weights. Um, but, but this remains doubly robust when I misspecify this or this. I should mention there is another property called local efficiency, which means that if I get both correct, this estimator will attain a thing called the variance bound, meaning it will attain the best standard error, large sample variance, any humanly constructed estimator can attain, okay? So basically, because of math, you cannot beat this estimator except if you make extra assumptions. Okay. Okay. And now again, I always want to give a version that's very convenient for people who like doing some of their programming. If, so if you want to avoid these summations, what you can do is you can run a big multivariate regression of the outcome on treatment in the trial using the weights I defined above. And then you take the predictions you take that predictive model, the estimated coefficients, and you predict outside the trial, and you take the average, and it just happens that you'll get a doubly robust, um, efficient estimator with some limitations. So as far as I can tell, this will only work if you are willing to assume that your outcome belongs in what is called the linear exponential family. This is not that bad because it will cover binary, continuous, count outcomes, as long as you're willing to uh, assume the corresponding families, you know, binomial, uh, Poisson, normal. And basically, you only need to model the mean and the variance correctly. You get all the GLM properties. Um, as long as you fit it the way your computer already fits it, okay? This says the way your computer already fits it, basically. Okay. So this is very convenient because you need minimal programming just put the composite data set together, run the regression in the trial with weights, then predict outside the trial and take the average. Okay. Okay. So now I said a lot of stuff. The, many of the stuff I say is asymptotic, meaning it holds only as the sample size goes to infinity. So what we usually want to do is we want to do a small simulation study to convince ourselves the properties kind of hold in reasonable data sets. Okay, so here's my overall setup. I'll have a randomized trial and I'll have baseline covariates from the target population. Um, and I've chosen settings so that there is very strong selection into the trial, meaning there are certain covariates that make it much more likely to be in the trial than not to be in the trial. And there is strong effect modification by those predictors of trial participation. And then I'm going to analyze that data in multiple ways, the multiple ways we just reviewed. Okay. So these are the two trial sample sizes I'll use. It's a smallest trial, two arms, so it's 125 on average per arm, 500 or 1,000. And then I assume a somewhat bigger, but not enormous, target sample from the target population. To give you a sense, when we've used these things, we've often had trials of 500 to 1,000, and depends on your source of historical data, but you can easily get up to millions of people here now with routinely collected data. So these are not that uh, uh, fantastical in terms of size, okay. And then I parameterize the covariate distributions in a peculiar way to ensure that I have correct specification of a logistic regression model when I model the probability of participation, and I get some control on how strong is the selection on the effect modifier. So whenever this zeta value is big, I have a much stronger selection into the trial. And to make it a little adversarial for the methods, I actually will show you results for zeta equals one, which is a pretty strong selection, okay? And then um, the outcome model I give here, most of the coefficients don't matter, so here I show you just one version. The important one is the one about the interaction of treatment and X1. When phi is zero, when there is no interaction in the outcome model, no statistical interaction, or in epidemiological terms when there is no effect modification, the trial will give you an unbiased estimate of the mean difference uh, without need to try, right? 
but to the extent that this phi value is not zero, and this zeta is different from zero, then x1 is an effect modifier on which participation in the trial is being selected. So you'll get the wrong answer if you just analyze the trial and try to apply it to everyone or to the people not in the trial, okay? Okay. So this is a busy table, but the big idea here is we would prefer everything to be very close to zero, okay? Because it means in these sample sizes we've considered, on average we get the right answer. And you can see all of the estimators except for the trial, I'll come back to the trial in a little bit, are very close to zero for all scenarios we consider, okay? Now, the trial, you can check whether what I told you is true. I told you when in the trial there is effect modification, when that means phi equals one, the trial will give the wrong answer, and indeed you can see whenever phi is one, the trial gives a very biased answer, okay? By a unit of one. Um, so this is an, not an exciting table, except that it confirms the near unbiasedness and finite sample. Okay. This is a much more exciting table, I think. Here I'm showing you the variance, basically how jittery are the answers that you get from the different estimators. The first thing I will suggest is that the trial um, variance is not that interesting, because we already saw that the trial is pretty biased when phi is one, so at least the trial variance when phi is one is not that meaningful because we know it's giving you a maybe precise answer around the, uh, around the wrong number. The trial variance when phi is zero is interesting because you can use it as a kind of baseline. Okay, so the one thing to notice is the inverse probability, inverse odds of participation weighted estimator with unnormalized weights does abysmally badly because these are very large numbers if you compare them with any other number on the table. The normalization of the weights makes a difference, especially in small data sets, but it's still much worse compared to the inverse odds of participation augmented estimators, which are the doubly robust ones, okay? So you can see even in um, very small sample sizes, these do much, much, much better than the inverse odds of participation weighted ones. And then the outcome model one in this simulation cannot be beaten because it turns out to be the best estimator. But you can see that as the sample size gets large, the doubly robust estimators actually start to get closer to it, okay? Asymptotically, they actually a bound, and it's the same bound that the outcome regression estimator would hit if you had used a very flexible model. Okay. So take home methods. We have multiple ways that give nearly unbiased answers, some of which perform much better in the variance and consequently mean squared error sense. And these tend to be either the outcome regression ones, which we said are analogous to multiple imputation, or the augmented inverse odds of participation weighted ones which come from the theory of semi-parametrics, okay? And these have the extra bonus of double robustness, meaning you can get the outcome model wrong and they'll still give you the right answer. Their variance will go up a little bit, but it, they will still concentrate on the true value, okay? So this is the more maybe practical part where I'm going to apply these methods in the coronary artery surgery study. This is a quite interesting comprehensive cohort study where there was a randomized trial of medical versus surgical therapy for coronary artery disease. Um, about 400 people in its randomized arm and about 1,300 people declined randomization but met the exact same uh, eligibility criteria. It's actually a wonderful case for trying these kind of generalization methods because the setting was near perfect. The randomized and non-randomized individuals were seen in the same research centers, and when surgery was done, it was done by the same surgeons. There was a common follow-up protocol, same outcome definitions, same follow-up procedures. 
There was a rule for determining treatment initiation in the non-randomized individuals, by treatment initiation I mean time zero. There is near complete follow-up. In fact, I used 10-year data here and not a single person dropped out um, by year 10. There was a pretty large number of baseline covariates with nearly complete data and both the randomized group and the non-randomized group are sizable. Okay. Okay. So what we did here in the application is we estimated the probability of participation and you can see there is very good overlap for the probability of participation among participants and non-participants. S1, the trial participants are solid lines. S0, the non-participants is the dust line and you can see the overlap is pretty good and importantly both um, uh, tails are pretty far from the extremes from one and zero. This seems to track along with my observation that the people in the centers were pretty closely, uh, pretty carefully chosen to be eligible for the trial and similar. And here I calculate the odds weights which I defined earlier on basically the probability of not being in the trial divided by the probability of being in the trial times the probability of treatment. This is the inverse odds of participation weight and you can see this is pretty well behaved reflecting the fact that these two were bounded away from zero and one. Uh, by well behaved I mean it's not a very big number. In general very big numbers here are dangerous. Okay, they tend to make the weighted estimators very unstable. That's not the case here, and because that's not the case here, um, there is very few differences between the different uh, estimators. So you can see all of the generalizability results for the outcome regression, the inverse odds weighting estimators, and the augmented, the doubly robust uh, estimators are pretty similar, about a one and a half percent higher rate perhaps compared to surgery and a little lower for medical therapy. And you can see the confidence intervals. Uh, these are from the bootstrap, uh, 10,000 uh, uh, resamplings. Um, they're pretty similar. That's again because the weights were very well behaved in this case. Otherwise, you, as in the simulation, can often see a big difference between the odds weighted and the doubly robust ones. Okay. So, um, If you are interested in contrasting the treatments, what you could do is you could just take the difference of these two columns. I'm just not showing it to save space. Okay. Oh, and one more thing. Sometimes when people see a result like this, they say, well, I don't need uh, to use all these methods. That's not, not actually correct. At least for the outcome regression and the weighting methods, because they rely on different working models, comparing their results serves as a kind of informal uh, model specification test in that if they are very different, you would by logic know at least one of the two models is badly misspecified. Okay. Okay. So for survival analysis, I'll just tell you it's possible. Um, a lot of the things become more complicated because the augmentation requires fancier mathematics, but it's possible we have those things uh, implemented and in simulation studies they appear to perform as well as for the non-failure time case. I say this because in my experience trying these things out, more often than not the outcomes clinicians are interested in are failure time outcomes, or at least some of them. So in conclusion, what I think is the take home message here is if you have a trial that you think might be relevant to your set setting, but you worry that the people in the trial have a different distribution of effect modifiers compared to the distribution of effect modifiers in your usual patient population, there is outcome regression, probability of participation, and augmented or doubly robust estimators that can be used to take the findings from the trial you're interested in to the target population that you're interested in. And you don't need outcome or treatment information in the target 
you also don't need no confounding assumptions in the target, which is a difference from conventional observational studies. A lot of the stuff that I saw depends on model specification. The behavior of these estimators is quite interesting under misspecification. There is lots of areas of application that involve machine learning for getting better uh, models for each of the working models I presented. And I didn't know, but I found out at least some people here are interested in machine learning. So I'll, I'll tell you a secret. If you use the outcome regression estimator or the inverse probability, inverse odds weighting estimator, and you estimate the corresponding models with machine learning, both the outcome regression estimator and the inverse odds of participation estimator will often perform very badly in a sense that's often considered unacceptable. They'll converge to the true value at a rate slower than square root n, um, which is, you know, most people don't like that. This thing will allow you the doubly robust estimators will converge at square root n rate under much more general conditions for the estimation of the working model. So that's a slightly more technical, but for people into machine learning, important, I think, um, reason to go with the doubly robust. And with this, I thank you. I pick. I mean, why don't we do it in order? So maybe I misspoke. If you have lots of X's, I want to emphasize that at least the DR methods will be able to handle them. If you don't have high dimensional X's, what happens is the mean transportability assumption might become more tenuous, but then the regression aspect of things becomes easier. Now, an interesting thing that happens is when you um, you have the kind of X's that you think would help for both populations, but you have difficulties like the variables don't line up perfectly or the coding is not the same. Um, I don't want to say too much because we've focused on cases where the data part was easier, as I showed you here, but I, I feel imputation methods or linkage methods might be particularly interesting in that case because basically you would fill in the information using what is common for the things that are not common. I, I want to say one more thing. I tend to emphasize mean independence conditions because I want to estimate the mean under the treatment, under each treatment. Um, that's because I feel sick people want to know uh, what's their probability of a particular event. They don't just want to know What's the benefit of using one treatment versus the other? If you happen to be in a setting where the only interesting thing is the difference, like a mean difference type contrast, you can actually use these methods with much weaker assumptions uh, because all you need to have measured is not the X's that give you mean independence. You just need to measure the effect modifiers. So often that's a much smaller set. The strong effect modifiers are a much smaller set than the set of, let's say, all outcome predictors. Um, and there is some technicalities about efficient estimation, but pretty much things work out in that case as well. There was another question. Yeah, I have two questions. So the first is, why is incrementally you are estimating yeah. a randomized trial? Why is that? Why I knew someone would give me a tough time about that. Okay, so are you the one who said you are teaching statistics? You had you yeah, mentioned you. But okay, I, I it, 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 I'm just tra trying to calibrate what I say. So okay. basically, if you if you plan on using parametric models, nothing bad happens to the large sample variance if you estimate that thing. And in finite samples, you get to ten, you tend to get somewhat smaller standard errors, because the weighting fixes the imbalances in the trial. 
in terms of the observed covariance. The formal explanation has to do with the asymptotic variance bound being the same whether you know or don't know the probability. And there's a ancillary issues, so I, I don't want to go into those. But nothing bad happens if you estimate it. A little bit of, yeah, smaller standard errors. And So you might have to tell me a little more about what the particular complication you have in mind is. Don't use inverse odds. Use the doubly robust. Okay. <laughs> so is okay. that well, exactly for how like, our doubly There is an archive uh, preprint that has all the results I presented. Okay. 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 But, uh, and there, I have a new version that does a lot more of the semi-parametrics if you are interested. Basically, for consistency, all that matters is that you have a correctly specified conditional model. So I don't see where the non-collapsibility would come to hurt you in this application. Um, I, don't, I don't see a concern now. What I've seen in, if the sample sizes are small, sometimes um, for some reason near violations of positivity tend to be a lot more impactful for the odds weights. My impression is that when you use the composite data sets, there tends to be, on average, less overlap. And so I don't think it's a problem with the odds weights. I think it's a problem with the data that tend to be used with odds weights. Yeah, and that has a less yeah, yeah. A lot of the instability will be addressed by the doubly robust estimator. It tends to, it's an observation many people have made for confounding control too that the DR property tends to also improve, you know, the problems from extreme weights. It's all the more reason to do that one. You're giving, everyone's giving me a hard time. It's, it's, it's a good question. So it turns out with the assumptions I stated, under the non-parametric model consistent with only those assumptions, the semi-parametric model only with the assumptions I listed, it turns out you, the math tells you not to use the treatment and outcome in the target. Okay, the object that is spat out by the black box of semi-parametrics, the influence function, includes certain indicator terms that tell you not to use those things. Intuitively, the reason is um, you, to make good use of the people outside the trial, you either have to rely on a modeling assumption, a certain modeling commonality between people in and outside the trial, and in some cases, you even need a no confounding outside the trial. So it kind of makes use of extra either modeling or structural assumptions, I think, for the intuition. So now, in practical terms, if you think you have a really, really, really good model, um, you could use it. But then you wouldn't be using my method. You know, you're making extra assumptions. Don't. It's often useful, though, to do an observational study if you have treatment and outcome outside and compare that with the extrapolation. 
because then you are repeating two sets of structural assumptions, no confounding outside versus the mean transportability conditions. So that's kind of interesting because if you get very different answers, it means at least one of the two assumptions is wrong, possibly both. Questions? Use these methods, please. <laughs> if you have trials or... I don't see any more questions. Does anyone have any more questions for either Roy or Tao at this point? Okay, I guess we've we've reached the uh, the end, which is we're actually a couple of minutes early. So I want to thank the speakers again for great talks. And um, so, as this was our first symposium, we're planning to have um, lots more. Um, there'll be a survey going out very soon. Um, please fill it out. We'd like to get your feedback um, on on the topics that were discussed today. In particular, um, I'd be interested in knowing whether the, the information was useful to you, um, was accessible. Um, I think this was a nice mixture of theory and application. Um, for those people who are you know, more, more knowledgeable, probably were able to understand more of the theory, but I think even so, we could all see that there, there are real important applications here of these methods. Um, and so, and, and these speakers are, are, are local, so you can, you can definitely talk to them, and I think they'd all be, be, be happy to, to, to answer questions. Um, now, in terms of going forward, we're going to be having additional symposia. So one of the questions we're going to be asking you on the survey, um, we'd like to know kind of what, what topics you're interested in. One that we do have planned for the fall is a symposium on systematic review and meta-analysis, um, which um, we'll hopefully be offering in um, sometime after the semester starts. And uh, so that, that may, may or may not interest those of you in the room, but if you have other colleagues who might be interested in that, um, please let, let them know. Um, and uh, Gabby, is there anything I've forgotten to say? I think that's it. Thanks for coming, and check back soon for the recording if you're interested in rewatching. Okay, yes, yeah, so, and, and there's lunch, lunch outside, and there's plenty of food, so, so um, take this time to, to converse. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>